Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. All right, welcome, Fally. I'm sitting here with Fally Klein, a maverick. Good one, yes. <laughs> maverick, catalyst. Yeah, just before we got on, I asked you um, what you are, and it's clear I have the same thing you have, by the way. I, I do not want to be pigeonholed by the one. Oh, you're the guy who talks about sex abuse. No, I'm not. You're the guy who talks about porn. No, I'm not. You got right. the podcast. No, I'm not. <laughs> you are, but you're not. Right. It's not who I am. It's, yeah, I do that. You know, it's like yeah. in recovery. You say, like, hi, I'm Larry. I'm an alcoholic. No, I like, in, in sex addiction, it worked better, but so like, I am a sex addict. No, I have sex addiction or I'm a recovering, you know, I'm recovering from sex addiction. It's more of a distance from it. It's not like me. I hear that. Right. Yeah. I've always had a problem being pigeonholed because I feel like I'm not done. I'm not done growing. I'm not done growing up. And every time I felt that people figured me out, I started feeling resentful. And not because people thought they had me figured out. I mean, my deepest need, every human's deepest need is to be seen, is to be known, to under, be understood. So just as people were thinking that they understood me was when I started feeling, but wait, is this really who I am? And usually people got to know me around something that I did or have become as a result of something else in my life. And what I found was people were getting to know me based on what I've done and what I've become, but they didn't really have a clear picture of what brought me there. And when I let people define me by what, excuse me, by what they thought I was, it sometimes took me away from why I got there to begin with and where I wanted to be going next. I felt almost obligated to stay in that persona that people had of me because it made people comfortable. When people could say, oh, this is who she is. And I'd be like, oh, does that make you happy to think that that's who I am? Okay, I'll stay here. Right, so obligated but wanting to break it at the same time. Right, especially the obligation I think came from a place of when people got to know me, it was because I had found ways to take things that I had learned and bring it forth to help other people. But then I became defined by how I could help people and not by, and it almost took me away from the freedom of, but I've been doing this to help myself and I really have more to go, more to learn. So what are some examples of those kind of steps on the path, so to speak? Well, I would say my, my path. I promised myself I'm not going to talk about this on the podcast because it's one of the things I've been trying to break from. So I was sick as a kid and I got known for that. I wrote a book about having been sick and it was a bestseller. I went into seven printings. I couldn't have anticipated that. And that's not why I wrote the book. And then for years I became known as that person who what wrote the, the, name book. Of the book. Miracle Ride. Miracle Ride. By, by, by Tsipi Katen. It was not written under my name. I wrote it under a pen name. And for years I was that person. And at a certain point, 15 years had passed, and people still knew me as the kid with cancer. And I was like, I was 16 when I wrote that book. I've lived a dozen lifetimes since then. There's so much more I want to be talking about. And people were flying me all around the world to talk about something that happened when I was 16. And I didn't want to do that anymore. So that was something that I had to break away from. And it doesn't, it's not that I made a cold break. It's still part of my past. You don't ever wake up and not remember that you were once a cancer survivor, you know, a cancer patient, it's still part of your identity, but it's not what I want to be known for. It's one of the things that shaped me, but it doesn't define me at all. So that's probably one of the first breaks that I had to have in my professional life or my public life. Then I went into hypnotherapy. That was my first love and where I started seeing clients. <coughs> seeing clients. Mm -hmm. And hypnotherapy was not something that was in at the time. Is it now? It's getting there. M more alternative stuff are coming through, so right. people are talking about it. So that's what I became known for at that point. And then I had gone into breath work and- How many years did you do hypnotherapy? We're talking 2013. So it's Got been it. a while. Yeah. And 
breathwork was something that I evolved into. I went to school for intimacy counseling. I've never stopped learning, so different people know me in different ways. I actually got a call this morning from somebody who was reaching out to me professionally, and it turned out that she actually lives in my neighborhood. She's someone I see every day. And uh, I asked her, what made you call me? She said, I just didn't know, like, I know you as this person, and now I got to know you as that person. Mm -hmm. So I've been known by many different names and under many different headers, and, but I have a hard time defining myself into any one of them. Right, right. It can feel restrictive. Yeah. Yeah. I had that with, um, when I was in yeshiva, I didn't like to dress too much like the um, yeshiva wanted me to. Obviously, there were rules around it, so I had to wear a hat that was a hat, but I was like, let me find one that's slightly different. And what I was resisting was meeting someone new or even walking down the street and then thinking they know me because I'm part of that that group like no it's you don't know me even if you knew me a year ago you don't know me you know so yeah so I, I understand I understand the I feel like there's some resistance to why would you think you know me when I don't even begin to know myself and I've lost myself in that for years sometimes people will think they know you or claim that they know you and it's such a nice feeling when someone looks at you and it feels like you're seen so sometimes you lose yourself in that and that joy of being seen, even in such a small way. And then you forget that your job is to actually see yourself, not sell yourself. So that took me a long time to learn. Right. I heard uh, Shays Taub, if you've uh, come across his work, once said that, you know, sometimes when someone is speaking, they can end up quoting themselves, where they'll be talking and something seems to land. And it can land also for the person delivering the message, not just for the audience. I was like, oh, wow, that was, like, that was a good one. I remember that. And then, <laughs> then in future speeches, that's no longer true the same way it was the first time it was delivered. <laughs> now it's just, I'm quoting who I once, who I once was. He's, I don't know, it was just, when he said that, I, I nodded my... I've definitely my been guilty of that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually give courses, and there's a Q&A component to the courses. So there's a lecture component, and then later on in the week, people send in their questions, and I answer them on a, on a Q&A. So one of the questions that came up this year, this is my fifth cohort of this particular course. The, so someone what is the to, course on? This particular one is called Vessel. It's Okay, I've seen your emails about it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're on my list. Uh, yeah. it's, it's about self-development. Yeah. Um, really becoming a, a field guide to your own inner world. I find that people do therapy and they hop from modality to modality and they may be missing some certain underlying principles of how to, how to be your own best navigator inside your own world. So that's what Vessel is. So this participant had sent in a question, if I could release the Q&A videos or audios from prior cohorts, because they're, they're hours. It's, sometimes the Q&As go for three hours, and it's eight modules. So you're talking about 24 hours of Q&A, just wow. Q&A. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not comfortable doing that. I don't know if I still stand by things I said two years ago or three years ago. I definitely believed them when I said them, but I've possibly evolved. Now, if you can bring a sound bite of something that I said three years ago, and I now change my stance, I'm more than happy to discuss that with you. I'm happy to, you know, people are nervous about what they put out on the internet because of what they change. And I'm like, no, that's okay. If I change, I can stand by the change that I've made. But because I no longer know if I stand, I'm not willing to put that out intentionally in public. You know, I, right. at the time when I said it, it's fine. But now that they're in past post cohorts, something from three years ago just feels. Yeah. yeah. It just feels like I've, I've evolved since then. I don't know if I want to be quoting myself anymore. Yeah. Last week I was in New York, so an organization asked me if I would stop by. And I mean, now I don't know what I talk about, growth, healing, my story. I'm not 100% sure whatever this podcast is about. But in a prior lifetime, I spoke a lot about porn addiction. And in an even prior lifetime, I spoke a lot about child sex abuse. And when I, when I came in there, so I spoke a little bit. And then... One guy starts asking me a question about stuff related to child sex abuse. Another guy starts asking me a question about the organization that I was involved in at that time. And I answered the first couple. I'm like, guys, I feel like I'm talking about someone else. I don't Right. Why are you asking me? I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, before, before I came down here, I remember asking you in the email, like, do you know what we're going to talk about? And you couldn't give me a straight answer. So I've been stressing about it because I was thinking, I really don't want to talk about things I've already spoken about. <laughs> I don't want to repeat my old sound bites and talk about the person that I used to be because 
there's so much more. Right. I, yeah, I, I kind of feel like I prepared my whole life for each conversation. I don't need to work on the specific questions or what it is. Sometimes there's, if someone is only one thing, then that's what you can talk about. Like this is, you know, and that's only one thing. It's someone who's really, really known globally. Like I sat with Dan Brule. I mean, obviously I'm going to talk about breath work, but a lot of other stuff come up as an example. But for most of us, it's just where it goes. So this conversation would have been different if we did it in the morning, for sure. How many hours are you recording today? No, it's not about that. I'm just saying it was a different, it was a different time. But gotcha. today, probably about eight hours of recording. Okay. Yeah, I'll do full days. So like today, this is my job. I'm, I'm recording. It's easier than doing two hours, you know, multiple days. I do two days a month. I just, I just record, and I usually do four, four podcasts in those days. That's amazing. I give you a yeah. lot of credit. What? I give you a lot of credit. Yeah, these podcasts, I didn't know there was the amount of work it is when I, when I started it. Yeah, but I love it. It's not just the credit that you, that you said, you know, and devote hours. It's to be the, the ability to attune to a brand new person basically every two hours. If you're doing four a day to create a whole new level of attunement and to give somebody their platform and their space and their voice when you've just come out of another conversation, it's, it's right. an incredible skill. Yeah, you know what I've wondered, I, I have a lot of different tools that I use um, for it, some more than others, depending on the like the heaviness of the last com conversation. Or, but um, I've wondered how therapists do this. I, I, specifically in that craft, because there's always a time limit in the way they, like the traditional therapy model. And there's like, okay, there's an hour, I'm gonna we'll do a 50 or 55 minute session have a few minutes and the next, and then to do eight of them in a day. And the hard part is not the hours. This, the hours is, is easy if you're enjoying the conversation. What you picked up, what you said was exactly the, the difficulty. The, the presencing with each individual. Right. It's f for me, this is um, my fourth conversation. But for most people who sit down, at, at this point, probably three of the four people I sat down with today flew in for the the talk, right? So from their standpoint, right, this is, they've geared up for this conversation. I have to meet them exactly there. Correct. Well, yeah. So respect for, thank you for recognizing that. Yeah. Yeah. That is the work of, of doing this. It's creating a completely different space with every person and not letting the old, whatever was in the previous one. I mean, right. Although yeah. talking about the previous one, we ended up having a conversation downstairs just from that last Thing that he shared as he was leaving and for me it just sparked like wow that that's his ending is my beginning you know in terms he was talking about coaching and therapy no no downstairs when he was leaving oh, over he there not in the, the podcast yeah i know he was talking about the olive phase and for me that's always been a fascination i was like that's so funny i didn't know what i was going to come here and talk about and then as he's leaving and that's the last thing he leaves with i'm thinking well okay that's it always comes back to the olive phase right so let's let's go there what is sure uh what's my fascination with the olive phase yeah I feel like one of the reasons I've had a hard time defining myself into any one modality, even though I've really given myself over to these modalities that I've learned and mastered. And I don't say mastered as in I'm the best, but anything that I go into, my goal is a level of mastery. And by that, I mean, I don't, it's not about owning it, but I want to surrender to something so completely that it just becomes a way I breathe. So one of the reasons I've had a hard time letting myself be defined by any one modality is because I never felt that anything could be limited. Anyone's journey could be limited to like, oh, this is the modality that's gonna heal me, right? I always felt that there were patterns. And that's one of the things that I've always been gifted at seeing, there are patterns. Sometimes I would be in a room and I, I would hear two different people from two different corners of the room have the same conversation. And I'd be like, do they know that they're doing that? These two people, do they know each other? And I would pick up a lot of cues like that, a lot of repetitions, a lot of patterns, or sometimes I would see someone talk about an issue and I would just know based on their body shape or the cadence of their voice that they were having an issue with certain nutrients that, were, that they were missing. And I didn't know how I knew all of those things, right? There were things that, and people would sometimes say, oh, she's psychic or she has this extrasensory perception. And I don't like that. I don't like to have a mystery like that that makes someone untouchable. One of my big things, right? De despite not wanting to be defined, you want to be understood. And you want to feel like you're relatable. You don't want to walk around the world feeling like a stranger. 
Like nobody gets you. So when people had this, yeah, they love doing that to you. Like, oh, she's she's just different or she's mystical or she's magical. And it's like, it that, that gets old really fast. Like in the beginning when they say that to you, it's like, that's cool. Like I'm amazing. And then after a while you're like, actually it's it's not that. There's there's a science to all of this. And I wish you could see what I see. And I wish you can see the the patterns that I see. So for me, no matter what I was studying, I always noticed that there were certain underlying blueprints that were the same no matter where I went. But nobody was talking about the blueprints. Nobody was talking about how everything connected. And sometimes I just realized, I don't think my teachers know. I was going to study from really good teachers, and they were very devoted to their craft, but they couldn't think beyond it. And it always amazed me. Like, don't you know that you just said the same thing that I heard in a completely different discipline from a completely different teacher all around the world, and you're saying the same thing, and then finding that a lot of these patterns came down to things that I had known, like in, in religious practices or my Judaism. And it was very mystifying to me that nobody was seeming to pick up on them. So a lot of my work became, yes, for years I developed skills, and I, I'm really proud of those skills and those things that I became known for. But at the same time, lately I've just been wanting to say, wait, but if we can crack the code, if there's a pattern here and we can come back to the, to the code of creation, we wouldn't be chasing modalities or gurus or magic pills because we, we would have the code in our hands. And that's been my work for the last while. And this connects to the Hebrew letters. The Hebrew letters is one of the codes of creation. I think there's so much that could be said. If you know the letters of a person's name, you know everything about them. You know, in ancient traditions, they didn't give out names. There are still cultures till today where a person will not give out their name because if you know someone's name, you have mastery over them. The, that's where the Baal Shem Tov comes from, right? He was the master of names. When you have mastery over names, you own things. You can control them. You can connect with them because if I wanted to get you to turn your head, all I have to do is use your name. And I had a certain level of power over you. And it's not power, but it's dominion or, or connection um, that creates movement. So in, there are certain ancient cultures that will not share names. Your, your true name is, belongs to you. But in, in our culture, in the Jewish culture, we believe that your name carries, it's the vessel of your soul, right? In the letters that compose your name, give you certain character, characteristics mm -hmm. or qualities. Uh, that's why some people are really hesitant about giving double names or triple names, especially if they're not going to be called by that or using nicknames. So I've been watching these things. I've been noticing things. I would notice that certain people who had the same names had certain similarities in their personalities. And I've been wanting to distill that. What is that thing that I'm seeing? And all of the people that have this name, or sometimes I would meet a person who had that name and they wouldn't have quite that same quality. So then I just knew you have a second name. And they would be like, oh my God, how did you know? And I'm like, yeah, because you don't, there's something different about you than all the other, you know, <laughs> you know, Moshe's that I met. So there's something different. And, and it just became something that I started being able to read. At a certain point, it was, it was more than just the letters. There, there are one of the blueprints of creation. I think the blueprint of creation is the Aceres de Debros, right? Uh, I, I really believe it's one of the most misunderstood and overlooked pieces in all of the in everything. <laughs> so for me, that a lot of my work comes back to that. Your name is? Fali. Which is? The letter Aleph backwards. My name is Fela. Fela. Fela, yeah. Like miracle? Yeah, but it's, it's not Pella, which would, miracle would be Pella. This is Fela. Spelled differently. Yeah, it's, it's spelled differently. So it's Aleph backwards. Aleph backwards. Is that a common name, is that? No. No. It's a family name. How did it? You don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Um, none of my cousins who have the same name are actually called by this name. We all have other names that we might be called by. I'm the only one in the family that's called by this name. I've always liked it. I've always felt that it very much fits everything. How do you know that it's Aleph backwards? I made it up. Oh, you made it up. Okay. Completely made it up. Right. Yeah, if my parents are watching this podcast, they are laughing. They're like, <laughs> that her name is not Aleph backwards. I don't know where she's making this up from. <laughs> you know, at one point... It came to me, actually. I, I saw it. I didn't, I never knew what the name meant. I liked it anyway, because I felt like it was mine. There was only ever going to be one folly in the class, you know? And, uh, and. Where did you grow up? In Borough Park. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Go, yeah. So 
there was this one moment where I was in a, a deep meditation and and I I felt this is kind of a piece that I don't really share in public so I felt at one time at one point I was in, I was in a diff very difficult point in my life and I needed I needed help and I went into just some deep contemplative meditation and prayer and at one point I remember thinking, you know, we're surrounded by angels. We, we say that in Shema every night, right? Why don't I take advantage of what I already have? So I just kind of imagined myself in front of them. And the minute I had that in my imagination, I was speechless. I didn't feel like I could speak and, or even think in my head, right? And the first thing that came up, the first thing that I felt that I could say was, your names all have Hail in it, God's name, right? Aleph Lamet. Yeah. And I, and they said to me, or that's what the perception I got. Well, our names define who we are, and we are in the service of God. So you know, Raphael is the he heals right. in God's name. I said, Wow, that's what I want. I also want that in my name. And all of a sudden, I saw the letters of my name displayed in front of me, and all of a sudden, they just flipped backwards. And I, I saw that, I saw that how, you know, the letters of my name just, it had, it was, it was Aleph, you know, backwards. And I, Aleph is spelled Aleph Lamed Pei. Hey, right. My name is spelled Pei Aleph Lamed Aleph. So there's an extra Aleph in there. So I was kind of like, eh, my name isn't really Aleph backwards because there's an extra Aleph in there. Right. And the answer that I got was, yeah, because you didn't want to be without God's name, no matter what you did whether your name was forward or backwards, Aleph Lamed is always there. And that has been something of my journey as well, that I've always felt that no matter what I do, I really don't do this for me. This is a, it's not my world. This is God's world. And all of the work that I do has to be about coming into alignment with something much higher than myself. And so that's what I feel like everything I've ever wanted to do. I think when people talk about healing, what they what they're really talking about is getting out of pain. That's not healing. When people say, I've done a lot of healing work, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of like saying I've done a lot of chemo. That's not, when you, when you finish with chemo, and I've, done, I've had cancer twice, so you, when the doctor tells you you're done, you're not actually healthy. So chemo takes you out of danger, but it doesn't build up your health. And I feel like so many people run to, let's call it trauma work, I'm like, no, but you don't know why you're doing this. What are you going to do when you're out of pain? Do you know who you are when you're not in pain? Do you know who you were meant to be? And I don't think people know. And I think that keeps them attached to their pain for a very long time. I think sometimes people are so close, and then they just don't want to let go. They don't know how to let go. And I think it's because they don't know why they're here. So all of my work, no matter what I've ever done, it's been about so much more than just getting people out of pain. It's about helping them remember who they are and bringing them back into alignment with a higher order. Right. I, ha I have this theory that the, like the fear that guides a lot of that is the fear of the responsibility that would come if and when we know. In the fear of growing up, the fear of healing is the fear of the responsibility that will come. It's ironic because what healing actually is it gives you back the ability to respond. To choose. Right. But right. it gives you back your response ability. Right. And when people who are so afraid of responsibility, the reason you're afraid of responsibility is because you don't believe that you have the capacity to respond, that you, don't, that you have the ability to respond appropriately to what life demands of you. And I think that true healing is about empowerment, is about helping people believe in themselves again. So that responsibility doesn't feel like responsibility. It feels like a gift. It feels like purpose. It feels like meaning. It feels like, wow, this is why I wake up in the morning. So I get to do all of these things. Right, so I think we're in um, interesting times because you've been at this for a while. Yeah. Um, in some ways, I have as well. Right, I was... In uh, I don't know, maybe it was 2013, I 
I don't know exactly how, what led up to it, but I, I suggested to Mayor Seawold, who was running JCW, Jewish Community Watch at the time, that we do a documentary on child sex abuse. And what I had said was that, you know, there was a lot of, I don't know if you're familiar with the organization, but there were publicizing offenders. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people had issues with that. And at first I was like, how could they? What are they, crazy? Like, these people are abused kids. What's, what is your issue with publicizing it? But after I thought more about it, I'm like, yeah, of course. The abuser is always a face, and the victim, the one who's gone through the experience, the painful experience, is always hidden. And even when you, they finally come to the light, there was this book that I really liked called Hush. I don't know if you knew. I remember, I remember that book. So I was like, wow, Hush was all about secrecy and breaking secrets and the power of doing that and finally speaking. And she wrote it under a pen name. Right. I'm yes. like, what? I guess it's better than not writing it at all, but you kind of fed the, the beast just a little bit with that move of writing it under a pen name. Or how many people spoke about being a survivor and their face was blurred out and their voice over. So I said to Mary, I said, hey, if we can do this, uh, like we can probably change the, the conversation a little bit. Let's just show who it is we're talking about who's sexually abused. And at first he was skeptical that people would, would do it, but I said, let's put it out there. I said, I'll do it. He's like, I'll do it. So I said, okay, that's two. Let's see what we get. We ended up getting seven, and uh, some men, some women. And uh, we called seven Orthodox survivors speak out. My point at that time that I was like, these concepts were like so foreign, healing and abuse and how it affects people and then addiction. What All of these things were just, it started coming on the scene more and more. And I feel like now we're at the moment that maybe COVID kind of, I feel like COVID um, like shrunk 20 years into one. Like what was yeah. going to happen over 20 years? It's like, let's just accelerate it. And this is the world we have now. And um, now we're kind of here, which is what we were, what I think what I was fighting for, like what I want, like open your eyes, see how, how the kind of pain people are in. You know, as soon as I started working on my addiction, at first I thought I was the oddball out. I was like, okay, I'm the one with the problem. And then when I went back, you know, into shuls and other spaces, I'm like, 90% of people <laughs> belong in here. I'm not here unique because I have an addiction. I'm unique because I'm working on it. Yeah. And, you know, at first it feels, it felt like I wanted to shake people. And then eventually, okay, like, we don't have to be evangelists. Just, you know, work on myself and do my thing. But at the same time, hoping that, you know, people aren't suffering and that they see a way out. So now... We're kind of here. Do you you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. Okay, so is it all you wanted it to be? I mean, healing is, it's open, it's available, it's accessible. Everyone's talking about it. Right. I don't know if we're really here, to be honest. I think I have a background in hypnotherapy. But before that, I was in advertising and marketing. There's a lot of similarities between advertising, marketing, and hypnotherapy. Uh, hypnosis. Mm-hmm. People used to come to me and be like, I don't know if I can be hypnotized. And I would just laugh to myself. You already were. The brand of toothpaste you're using, you did not make that choice. You were hypnotized into making that choice. Right? There's so, there are so many different ways in which we control con- consumer minds. And what I'm noticing now, I don't have social media, but what I am noticing is that the greatest illusion right now, is that we are hypnotized into being awake or not awake. If you scroll through Instagram and you notice how catchphrases keep coming up, and then all of a sudden everyone is saying the same words, and they're all repetitions of one another, to me, this is literally what I do for a living. I notice patterns, and I was in advertising, marketing, and hypnosis. I can recognize hypnotic language a mile away. We were hypnotized into believing we are woke, we are awake, we are not. Everyone's speaking this language. They're actually just hypnotizing them. One of, the, one of the, the keys of hypnosis is repetition. The more we repeat something, the deeper into the psyche we are. And what I'm noticing is so many repetitive words, so many repetitive mindsets. And I'm like, you're missing something. You're missing something big. Just regurgitating the same words or going to another retreat or going to another therapist or saying, if someone says the word healing journey again in front of me, I'm just going to I'm just gonna laugh. I'm going to have a hard time keeping a straight face. Everyone's on some sort of healing journey and nobody knows where they're going or how they're going to recognize that they're there if they ever get there. And so, no, I don't know if, if this is everything I've worked for. 
because on some level, I have a lot of gratitude that a lot of the modalities, when I was in college, way back, I was going for forensic psychology. I wanted to work in the prison systems and, and uh, I was coming to a point where I was realizing that I was struggling with certain things. And here I was very well on the way to getting my degree, but my own issues, like you're gonna send me, I was a 19 year old kid, and I mean, you could look at me, I'm tiny. I was gonna go into Rikers and work with criminals you know, in Rikers. And I was like, you are ready to send this little kid into Rikers, but this, you haven't gotten to the root of the issue. Like my issues are still issues. So something is not adding up. And it led me into more holistic approaches. And I remember that at the time, the more academic institutions were not a fan of holistic approaches at all. Today, a lot more is coming into right. the mainstream. And I remember having to make a decision. Am I continuing with my collegiate education or am I kind of moving away from that? And I never finished my, my degree. And I kind of went off in a completely different direction. So now I should feel a lot of gratitude that the world is doing a lot of this stuff that I feel like I sacrificed a lot to go the, this alternative route because for many years, people would look at me and be like, what are you doing? You're not even a real therapist or the stuff that you're doing is obscure, like hypnotherapy and breath work. Like what's wrong with you? Like what, what, when people would hear that I did breath work and this is seven, eight years, seven years ago, they were like, you're just gonna teach me how to breathe? And I would be like, no, you're already breathing. I don't need to teach you how to breathe. And people had no clue what, or people would call me up and talk about hypnosis. Like you do hypnosis, is that like black magic? And I would be like, yes. That is exactly what it is. And people would ask me questions like, they would keep me on the phone for a consult, right? For a hypnosis consult. And they would say, but does it really work? And I would say, no, not at all. I've just devoted my entire adult life to practicing a modality that absolutely doesn't work. You know, and that was, mm -hmm. that was me in the beginning. People, I would get so much flack from people. So it's very gratifying for me to see what is happening, that these things are catching on. People are recognizing the validity of these things. But the reason I say I don't think we're here is because I know for myself, when I needed to pursue these things, I didn't pursue them because they were popular. I really sacrificed a lot to go in these directions because they meant something to me, they were important to me, and it was worth giving up a lot in my life to bring that, you know, to bring that in. I'm finding today that people practicing healing, they've made it so easy, or it's like someone called me up about attending a training and then after, again, going through a lot of conversations back and forth, asks me, is this training online or in person? And I said, oh, well, they're in person. And they said, oh, well, I can't do in person. You know, I have kids. And it's, it's shocking to me because if you are training to be an EMT and you're gonna save someone's life, would you train online? You're, you're, you have someone's life in your hands. And I'm finding that when someone tells me I cannot come to train with you in person, because I have kids, well, as it should be, you have kids, they are your priority, but then you shouldn't be seeing clients. When you're working with clients, you're taking someone's life into your hands. Yes, it may be their mental life and their emotional life, it may not be their physical life, but I'm finding that there's a huge drop in integrity in people now who are practicing healing or talking about healing. They're not giving it anymore the, the dedication, the sacredness, the intention that I would have wished to see in this work. So in a certain way, while I'm grateful, that it's becoming more mainstream and popular. In other ways, I'm, I'm sad that um, in some ways the quality has gone down, that things that I've worked very hard to maintain in a, in a sacred way, it's not that anymore. Right. Yeah, I guess I wonder um, what's better. And obviously we're not there, meaning the world is not there, right? So people are still struggling and in many ways the world is falling off a cliff more than Previously, so that's not what I meant by it. I meant specifically related to the awareness around um, a lot of these tools. But it reminds me of different th things I heard growing up, you know, around Chabad. So Chabad. So the first Chabad Rebbe um, was not a fan of Napoleon, and apparently, you know, there were different, very important Jews at the time who felt differently about this. But one of the things he was concerned about was that some of the essence of Judaism would be lost with the freedom that came in in that kind of society. And I don't know if that's an analogy or another analogy that's given for um, Chabad Hasidus in general is like there's a, um, a crown jewel that's crushed in order to save a king's life, in order to save. The king has to crush the, the, um, the 
jewel of it, like the crown jewel, in order for his son who's sick to get in the hopes that he gets just a little bit of this ingested so that he can heal. Meaning for sure. there is a um like a desecration that has to happen in order for something to be made accessible. Yes, completely understood. So meaning it's the other side of of the same coin and then It's kind of unavoidable is maybe what I'm saying. It's kind of unavoidable. Um, but in whole, it may be a good thing. Yes, I know. Because like if I go back to what I said before about people being hypnotized into thinking that they're awake, then there's a danger in... I, th I see people spending so much money sometimes on their, let's call it the healing journey. And I meet them five years later and they've gotten nowhere. In fact, they've gotten maybe more selfish or their relationships have tanked. And it makes me sad because I think people really want to heal. I think on one hand, you're right, the awareness is there. The awareness is really, really there. But there's a difference between awareness and self-awareness. And they're not, they're not the same. So there's an awareness right now by popular demand. These are conversations that are happening. happening, happening. But then there's self-awareness, which is an absolute demand if you really want to do this work. And people really don't want to become self-aware. There's a huge tendency to blame the perpetrator, right? Without saying, yeah, but what, what can I do? How can I, I, how can I build my inner world? I, I believe healing comes down to, to three very integral things. Number one, acknowledging what is without judgment. Just seeing things as they are. Can you just see the world as it is? Number two, taking responsibility. Once you see the reality, what can you take responsibility for? And number three is making a movement. And the movement that you would make is not a big movement. And I think the mistake that people make with healing is that they're looking for a huge movement and they skip the first two steps. They think that healing is about, I'm in pain, move me out of pain. And the two problems with that are, number one, big movements don't last. Number two, nothing can last if you don't do the first two steps of acknowledging what is and taking responsibility. But what I'm noticing is that with all this awareness of healing and different modalities, people are trying on modalities without coming back to the foundations of do you know how to just be aware, to say yes to life as it is. Right. Okay, so I want to give the other side of it and tell me what you yeah. think. So what I found, I mean, there's different kinds of healing, right? Some people kind of need, you know, light adjustments and some people need complete makeover, like... Overhaul. Yeah, complete overhaul. It's just like format the system. Well, yeah, whatever this was like, isn't working. Let's just tear it down and start again, right? Which is kind of the addiction recovery model. But you know, the twelve steps has been copy and pasted into he healing for every for for everyone. But that's essentially the twelve steps idea. Is are you all in? Right. If you're not willing to play with all your chips, then just go somewhere else. I mean, <laughs> you know, go to a therapist's office. But if you're willing to go all in and everything's on the table in order to heal, then this is the kind of place we'll incinerate you and we'll build you back up from scratch. So that process, I found, until someone feels their feet on the ground, on the low end three years, likely five years. That's what I found just from people coming in. Obviously, they'll feel like they're getting it after two, three months. Like, oh, I got it. And then the slightest thing you know, may send them over the edge. It's like, yeah, I'm healed and everything's good. Yeah, go back, spend a weekend with your parents, you're on your ass again, back here. And that goes over and over. And somewhere around three to five years of someone taking it fairly seriously, it's like, okay, now both feet are on the ground. This idea that you have may actually stay in your head for, you may actually believe it for the next year or two or something close to it versus these ideas that feel super certain and two months later, there's a completely, you know, different idea. So when I look at it as the individual process, you know, and I've watched this many times. I first went to, um, I, I started therapy. Well, I went as a child a little bit, but myself, I started therapy in 2008. 2013, I started the 12 steps. So I really consider my journey starting in 2013 as far as, healing. The other stuff, I was trying to lightly touch things around the corner. Didn't work. 2013 was a commitment. Okay, just burn this thing to the ground and see what, see what I can keep, still retain. And where I started feeling like my feet were solidly 
on the ground that when I touched it that and it felt solid, it actually was like it wasn't going to shift that much underneath me. Probably was 2017, 2018 where I was like, okay, this is an idea that I can hold on to. I can actually, um, I felt comfortable to commit to another human being that who I am today is I'm going to be some version of this, you know, <laughs> in uh, six months, a year, two years, three years. Um, and a lot of the, the, like the collective that has gotten into it is probably 2021, 2022, where all of this craze has happened. So if you look at it from that perspective, can you expect more? That's what I'm saying. If you look at it from that perspective? No. If you look at it from the individual perspective, meaning if you see an individual level, someone who said, um, Fally, I committed a year ago to, to changing my life. And I've done everything I could. And they're making the right moves. And they're generally they're surrendering. They're genuinely working on it. They're open. They're not, they've done the three things you're, you're looking at. They're, they're all in and working on it. And they say, I don't understand why I'm still struggling. It's been a year. And what you, what you're likely going to tell them, it's been a year. So I'm going to go back on a couple of things you said. Number one, they've done the three things. There's no doing the three things. You are the three things. I understand. You breathe the three things. It becomes a way of seeing life. You don't have to think about them. Number two, if you view healing from the perspective that you just shared, then of course you would not expect anything different than what we're seeing now. I don't view healing that way. Okay. People think healing is a linear process where we want to get from point A to point B. I'm an addict and I want to go to a place where I'm not addicted, right? Where I can build healthy relationships. I don't think of healing as point A to point B. I think of us as a boat in a vast ocean and you make a decision to turn the steering wheel one degree to the left. That's it, just one degree to the left. And then you keep sailing. And at the beginning, nothing changes. It's one degree to the left. But you keep sailing one degree to the left, you're going to end up on a different continent. And it wasn't actually that hard. And I think the most profound results don't come when you do a, a huge system overhaul. They come when you move one degree over and give it some time. And I think people also, they're looking for change in some of the biggest areas of their life. But real change is actually first seen in the periphery of your life. The, 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 the closer the relationship is to you, the harder it is, it's going, the harder it will be to change. So your relationship to yourself, your relationship to your spouse, your relationship to your children, they carry a lot of charge. They're very close to you. Correct. But when you make these very small movements in your life, really small ones, then what you're going to first start noticing change is more the people on the periphery of your life. That you don't have a lot of buy-in with them and you don't have a lot of repetitive action with them, or repetitive cycles. So you start noticing, you know, I actually stood up for myself there. Or, you know, I didn't shoot off that text the way I normally would have. I thought twice. Or maybe I didn't think twice before sending off that text and worrying about if they'll be upset with me. So the real changes you first start seeing in very small pieces at the edge of your life. And they kind of, again, they kind of bring in slowly. It's like they hug you from the outside of your life. I think most people are, when you think of change as a linear process, you think, I am here and I must be there. So there's a lot of shedding the old. This no longer works for me. Toxic relationships. Get rid of this. Get rid of that. One of my teachers, such a clean person. And then at one point, like I, I saw him smoke a cigarette. And I was shocked. And he said something like, this is not, like, I can't remember the word. Like, there are no bad habits. Or, no. Uh, he says, there's nothing wrong with the cigarettes. He says, the, the, what, what the problem is, is the habit things you get drawn into, right? So people are very much like, we have to give up the cigarette. And he's like, I don't have to give up anything. For me, I don't, I'm not addicted to it. I'm not, I, it's not, it doesn't own me. The only thing that is bad is something that you allow to own you. But change is not about stripping yourself of everything. It's about letting other things own you a little less. It's not about giving everything up. It's more about slowly, slowly taking more ownership of your own life. And so less of the other things. So what, we, so what are we saying that's different? That it's not a drastic overhaul. It doesn't need to be a drastic overhaul. And when you're saying that it could take three years to feel like you have your feet on the ground, I don't necessarily think so. I think that you're talking about someone who has wanted to be from point A to point B, and then maybe it'll take three years for them to feel, wow, I'm finally at point B. 
Is it possible we're talking about a different kind of person or you're saying anyone? I think anyone. Anyone. So you're yeah. saying someone who's drinking themselves to sleep every single night, night after night. Yeah. You're talking one degree shift. One degree shift. What would that one degree look like? One less glass a day. Just one less. Just one. I mean, you'd be arguing against 100 years of uh, AA. I know. Right. So A is about the 12 steps. Mm -hmm. I'm about the 10 steps. Which is? 10 commandments. Okay, so tell me how they're different. Okay, so I would start, I would start like this. In Hebrew, we call them the Aserah Sedibros, right? Okay. So we define that as, we translate that as? 10 commandments. You speak Hebrew? Right, it's utterances or words. Right. And there's this huge misconception that these are commandments. These are not commandments. The word commandments is mitzvos, right? And we've been going on to this, like, we've been hypnotized. Nobody has questioned this. You grew up hearing these words all the time, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments. You know that that word does not mean commandments, right? They mean utterances. Right. In English, when we say, I give you my word, what does that mean? A commitment. Right, it's my promises. Right. So God says, I'm giving you my word. I always had a hard time with the Aserah Sedibros because I was like, this is what makes me Jewish. Like, I stood there at Sinai for you to tell me not to murder. I don't think I've ever planned on murdering anybody. Like, this is what makes me Jewish. Tell me to, like, keep kosher, right? There are other things that make me Jewish. Right, so what did you... So I was like, something is not adding up. Also, in the Ten Commandments, many of them are the seven Noahide laws. So they weren't new, and they weren't only given to the Jews. So what was actually being given to the Jews at that time? Like, what was being given to the world? It wasn't just the Jews. What was being given at the time? And God was saying, I'm giving you the secret... I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. You want to know how I created the world? There's a secret to this. There's a pattern and there's a blueprint and let me tell you how it goes. And if you're going to start with, he starts with, I am God. Right. I am everything. Right. And that's utterance number one. If you understand that, if you really know that everything comes back to God, and it really does, because, you know, there's the, the God, God particle, like even science is coming back to this idea that we can't quite explain how even the smallest fragments of science work, like atoms. They're just electrons moving really, really fast. What keeps everything in vibration? What keeps everything in movement, right? So if you understand that, if you really understand and you're committed to this dedication of finding God in everywhere and everything, anywhere you go, then the next one is there will not be other gods for you. It's just a given, right? Nothing so why else, say it? Nothing else is going to matter, right? Right, but why, why say it if it's a given? One minute. It's a given. There will not be other gods, right? right? Then comes the third, which is you shall not use God's name in vain, right? What does that mean? Have you ever blasphemed? Like, what does that mean? You will not use God's name in vain. Do you have any idea what that means? I think so. What does it mean for you? Um, a lot of people have told me things in the name of God that were their own name. Okay. So I have a, I have a different perspective on this. Yeah. I mean, that's one perspective, yeah. right? What is the name of God? What is the name of God? Hmm? I mean, 72 names. I mean. What's the name of God? The name of God? Yeah, like in, if you look into the Aserah de Bros, if you look into the Ten Commandments, what's the name used over there? Right, Aleph Dal Nun No. Yud Kei Vav Kei. Okay. Have you ever, how do you say that name? How do I say it? Yeah, can you pronounce the name? I don't know how to pronounce it. Yahweh, I don't know. Okay, right. It's, yeah. it's called the ineffable name. Okay. But not because we don't say the name. We say many of God's names. Why not this one? Why is this the name that we do not say? Because you can't pronounce it. There are no consonants. It's Y-H-W-H. -H. You literally cannot pronounce that name. It's ineffable. Try making a Y-H-W-H -H sound. So you'd have to breathe it, you're saying? Yeah. It's literally the sound of a deep breath. If you take a breath in through your nose, your tongue goes up to the roof of the mouth like it does when you say the letter Y or Yud. At the top of the breath, there's a pause. That's the the hey. The exhale through the mouth is the the W. And the pause at the bottom of the breath is the H, the hey again. So when God says, do not take my name in vain, it means you will never speak in vain. There's not a single breath in your life that you will take in vain. You will know that you're always connected to a higher power. Every word you say, right? So how would that sound? It doesn't have a sound. It's the sound of a deep breath, right? In through the nose, pause, yeah. out through the mouth, pause. That's God's name. Okay. And everything that you say rides on the grace of God's name coming through your breath. You cannot speak if you do not have the breath. So go back to the beginning. God says, if we acknowledge that your whole mission in life is to see me, I am your God, you will not have any other gods. 
you will be so mindful of every breath you take. Of course, breath work is one of the things I became fascinated with. It's part of this whole journey. You will never use any of my words. Any word you'll say will never be in vain because you will understand that you need my name to power that. Then there's keep the Shabbos. Why? Because God says, I know this world. Those three first ideals sound so lofty, but I know the world I created. The world is literally designed to take you away from intention. So create a day of intention. Create mindfulness practices. Create the Shabbos so that you come back to these knowings, right? And those are the four God principles. The next one is the fifth, is honor your father and mother. Except the word honor is not really a word in the Hebrew language. The word kavit, you know, it doesn't mean honor. It doesn't mean respect. It means gravity. It means weight. Right. So kavit esavi chavesimecha means respect the weight of where you come from. It doesn't mean love your parents. It doesn't mean treat them nicely. It means respect the weight of who they are. Why? And it says, to lengthen your own days. But we know many people who honored their parents and then died young. So what does that really mean? And my perspective on this, I'm making this up as yeah. I go along. My perspective is, what, in quantum physics, there's this idea that time and space are not real. Mm -hmm. So I think the secret is here. If you want to know how to make more of every single minute that you have, and you can squeeze more, I can squeeze three times as much into one minute than most other people can. And where does it come from? Treating my four beers with gravity. I know where I come from. I respect everything that has come before me. And so every moment of my life is precious because I know that I'm not here by accident. It's generations of people that brought me here, and I respect every moment of what they did to bring me here. So I respect every moment of my life because it came at a price. Then the next one is, and also, Talking about the fifth, you need to also respect the gravity of what came before you because that's your direct link to God. God was a partner with your parents to bring you here. So God says, I know you want to be on this God trip and you want to find me. But if, you're, if you think you're going to find me without the blessing of where you've come before, you're, you're just going to go on this like fruitless search. And I don't mean that everyone has to have an amazing relationship with their parents. I think they just have to recognize that these were the right parents to catalyze their growth in this, in this world. So what I never understood was that the first five made a lot of sense in terms of how they link up. The sixth does not make sense at all. You shall not commit murder. And it's like, what does that have to do with honoring your parents? And what I realized is, is that in order for someone to commit murder, they have to have some sort of black hole inside of them. There has to be something inside of them that they've blocked out to not recognize the value of another human life. And what would cause someone to do that? Well, if you don't respect where you come from, then essentially you're turning away a part of yourself. You are a genetic composition of both of your parents. So if there's something in one of your parents that you hate, ultimately you hate that in yourself. So you've murdered off parts of yourself. So then you have the capacity to commit murder. And it doesn't necessarily mean murder of another. You've murdered parts of yourself, which brings us right into adultery. You shall not commit adultery, because what does it mean to commit adultery? You're not 100% there. You're not 100% in a relationship, right? Because you've murdered parts of yourself, so there are parts of yourself that are not showing up. The next one will be do not steal. And do not steal doesn't just mean do not steal someone's possessions or don't steal their time. It means do not kidnap. So when you've murdered parts of yourself, you've hidden in a shadow, you're always going to be with this empty hole inside of yourself. So you're going to use people. You're going to steal parts of people to help you feel full, to help you feel okay. And then... Like a codependency. Like a sorts. codependency. Okay. Right? It's a type of stealing. Yeah. And then comes... You shall not bear false witness. But what's very interesting is it doesn't say you shall not lie. It says you shall not answer. There's this word ahanane, which means to answer. It doesn't say just don't say sheker. I mean, sheker comes later in the, in the line, but losane. What does it mean to answer? So you use your voice for that. And something that we had spoken about before is that your voice, is, your voice print tells me a lot about you. The oxygen, the air you breathe, the name of God that has to travel through you in order for your voice to manifest. It goes, it touches every part of your being. But if there have been parts of your being that get shut off, then your voice is not an adequate indi indicator of who you really are. And I'll, I'll just show you that right now, what I mean by that. So we've been talking for a while now. And if I change my voice even slightly, like if I change my voice to talk like this, it's a very normal sounding voice. Lots of people talk like this. You walk in the street, you hear people talk like this all the time. In fact, you probably talk like this. But if you hear me talk like that, you're probably feeling anxiety because it's not my voice. It's a very normal voice, but you can feel that that voice up here, it didn't touch all the aspects of my being. I'm not showing up with my full self when I'm speaking in that voice. There's a part of me missing. So your voice is not complete because God 
isn't able to manifest fully in, 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 through you. So the witness that you bear is false witness, not just because you're lying, but because what you stand for isn't real. I can hear that in your voice, that you're not fully here. And so the last one is do not covet. And that's what I never understood either. And that brings us to addictions, right? How could God say, don't covet? How can he tell you what to feel? I can't tell you what to feel. So you have to remember, God is not commanding you. These are promises. God is telling me, if you experience the, exp the feeling of coveting, it means something is out of alignment in the higher order that come before. And if you can figure out what it is, if you can start from the top and check off the list, and you really work through those, you won't be brought to the place of coveting. Coveting is the last one. God is like, that's a sign. That's a sign of something is out of order. So when someone comes to me, usually, just because I've been seeking these patterns my entire life, usually I can hear or sense where something has been out of alignment. So I think that something like the 12 steps, the first port you start, point zero, is you covet, right? And so they take you beyond coveting to the 12 steps of how to uncovet. For me, covet is the end point. It's not the start point. So I go backwards. I want to figure out what got you there. So instead of having to change you, instead of having to give you an overhaul and to tell you addiction bad, stop, we're going to, re we're going to remodel you. It's like, what if you're just a symptom of something that's out of, you're just displaying a symptom of something that's out of alignment a little bit higher up. And if we can find that, Sometimes it's just this little tweak. Like I said, it's a boat turning by one degree. So yes, by the time you're at the bottom, by the time the boat hits that other continent, it's like, oh my God, we're in the wrong place. But it started, or maybe we're in the right place, right? But the shift that was made is a one degree shift. Now, if you're, if you're finding yourself in Australia when you really want it to be in you know, South Africa, then you're like, oh my God, getting from here to there is gonna be a big deal. But what if we can go back in time? And what if we can find that one degree that put you out of alignment? And all we had to do was just bring you one, that degree back. And because I mentioned before in quantum physics, time and space isn't real. So you don't actually need to overhaul. You can find that one degree in your brain or in your past or in your psyche that has been put off. You can fix it. And it's the simplest fix because it's a one degree fix. And if you have patience, you're going to see that manifest in every other area of your life. So, I, I mean, I'd like to see it, you know, I'd like to see it. But um, what I, let, let me clarify what I was saying about the 12 mm -hmm. steps, like what it is yeah. and what it isn't. So um, what it means is, right, when I went into the 12 steps on the outside, other than going to a meeting every single day, my life looked the same. I had the same job, the same friends, the same everything else. The idea is, is that you're going all in. Meaning, when you're going to a therapist's office, you're saying, permission to touch where I give you permission to touch. That's what, you, that's what you're saying to the, a, a traditional therapist's office. So, for example, if I walked into a therapist's office, um, I, which I did for years, this guy may have believed that a belief in God can help me, but he would never introduce it because he had no permission for me to go there. Mm. So it's like, let me touch around the edges. Chase Taubes has a, I'll bring up again, says a great story of a guy who um, walks into a bar, orders a drink, and throws the, um, uh, the, throws the drink back in the bartender's face. So the bartender kicks him out. The next day he comes back, and the bartender says, are you the guy who uh, threw a drink in my face? He said, yeah, yeah don't worry, I'm, I'm good today. So he says, you sure? He says, yeah, he pours him another drink, takes it and throws it in the bartender's face. She's like, you're done, you can never come back. Many months later, he shows back up at the bar. The bartender recognizes him. He says, I'm not serving you. He says, no, no, don't worry. I'm good. I, I went to therapy. Like, everything is fine. So he serves him a drink. Sure enough, he throws it in the guy's face. So he's like, what, do you, what, what happened? You said you went to therapy. He said, yeah, now I no longer feel guilty about it. All right, so it's like, meaning, it's like, you come to a therapist, and you tell him, this is my problem. I throw, help me solve this problem. I don't want to change it. So it's like, okay, so we'll, you won't feel guilty about it. Meaning I don't have full permission to go in and touch wherever I want to touch. 12 steps, when you want to embark on that process, you're essentially putting everything on the table. It doesn't mean, 
I mean, obviously certain person, someone's shooting up heroin or whatever else. Yeah, check out a life, go into a detox center and shut everything down. 12 steps is not, re- is not rehab. This is walk in and be willing to question everything in your life. With where you're trying to go, is your job helping you there? No, no, I absolutely need my job. Okay, so if you still want to have that conversation, like if, if I can't touch that with you, then you're not ready for what this process is. I'm not saying you should sell everything, move to an India. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is I have permission to go everywhere in this process with you if we want to heal. If you tell me something is off limits, then you are not ready for what this has to offer. It doesn't mean that day to day someone is going to see me with you know, long hair turning short or you know, these kind of pants or all my friends are out of my life or all my relationships out of my life, but everything is on the table. Like, are you willing to go all in and then everything is up for negotiation, up for discussion, or are you still trying to hold on to certain things? And then when someone goes through that process, it could be that complete surrender. It could be a while before someone feels like their feet are solidly on the ground where, okay, like this is something I can actually retain. Is is the job compatible with where I'm going? What kind of relationship am, am I going to have with my family? Which friends are still going to stay in my life? Like All of those questions, while it definitely should not look unstable to everyone around you, that's not the recommendation. When someone finally feels, like, okay, like these are my ideas, these are my beliefs, this is actually what I, I've sifted through enough of them to see which ones are helpful, which ones are not, then say, okay, this is who I am, this is my identity, then that could take pro- that that can take time that's what i've i found and you know people throw themselves in and psychedelics ayahuasca things that can touch stuff much faster in the real world it just takes time to put all those pieces together and and who that's what i mean that's what i mean by it like that complete overhaul so me so going back to where we started this conversation when people are running into to a bunch of different tools right and I mean, there are times where I do get nervous sometimes. I know what you're talking about. Like, I remember I was sitting around a Shabbos table and the conversation of psychedelics came up and a couple of the people, like, like, didn't even know some of the things they were doing were illegal and different. Like, they didn't understand that. I was like, I'm not telling you what people should do or not do, but understand what you're doing, number one. If you want to take a risk, take a risk. If you don't, don't. Like, whatever you want to do, but understand if you're taking a risk. Someone else, why did you do it? Because my friend said to do it. Do you understand that you can go into a place where memory can come up from childhood that can upend everything you know about your life? Like, do you understand that's what you walked into? It may not have happened. You may have sat and giggled for six hours straight. Or do you understand that what you're walking into may be a false memory? Could be anything, yeah. Right? Could be anything. And then sometimes people spin out on, over things that never actually happened. Right. So, meaning, like, understand you're going under the surgeon's knife, right? Is it to... Uh, because you have a kidney infection, or because you want to see what you might look like with a slightly bigger boob. Like, what is this actually about? And so, yes, I understand what you're talking about, that there's there's some of that going on. What I'm saying is, is that when you look at, like, personally and individually, when people are watching and searching for modalities, and I don't have anyone who's used the exact same modalities that I found helpful for me. I was having this conversation the other day with someone, and he said, I'm so confused. Which one do I need? What do I need to do to heal? I said, no, it has nothing to do with that. Like, it literally has nothing to do. I said, it would be as, it would be as relevant as if you asked me a question, how do I make my wife happy? Do I buy her a ring? Do I take her on a date? I said, no. The first thing is the commitment. What am I, the intention and the commitment. What is the intention? Are you trying to make your wife happy? Are you trying to change something in your life? Okay, that's number one. And then the commitment to it. And then all of these expressions become an expression of it. So I can dunk in the ice tub because... I feel this could be healing for me. I can dunk in it because I want an adventure or challenge, or I can dunk in it because I want something interesting to post on Instagram. There's a lot of different reasons I can do it. So first we start with what's your intention, and then those commitments to it, and then the expressions of it. And then it's not actually that confusing which modalities we, we, we run into. But what I'm saying is that individually, while a person is figuring that out, one or two years is not really a length of time. How long did it take you to get mastery over hypnotherapy, over self-awareness, right. over anything? It takes time. So I'm just being a little bit more optimistic about two years of this massive awareness around it. And yeah, there is going to be some some tripping up for sure. Yeah, oh, for sure. But I'm going to go back to something you had said about being all in, right? So for sure, that is a level that is required. But... My question to you is how hard is it to make that decision that you're all in? That's number one. How hard is it to sustain it for the length that you need it? And what happens if you can't sustain it? So let's say 
you've made it. What happens to people who fall out of the program? And I'm not talking within the first two years because that would be covered under my second question, right? How hard is it to sustain it? Um, but what happens after 10 years? You know, because in the 12 steps, you, you're still introducing yourself as an addict 10 years later. Listen, I have issues with the 12 steps I've spoken about. I no longer go to meetings, right? And there's a reason I don't um, is, you know, I'm, I'm sensitive to anything that becomes dogmatic. So once someone is like, this is the place and this has all the solutions, I mean, don't tell me this has all solutions when you're unhappy. So I'm six, seven years into recovery. I'm sober for multiple years and I still have anxiety and I talk to people about it and essentially there's nothing there that can find it, that can help me. So I went on a search and when I, you know, ayahuasca really helped me with, with my anxiety. And when I get those benefits of it and I go back to meetings and people, oh, ayahuasca, like, you know, what's going on? Okay, fine. So you've gotten comfortable with the Prozacs and you've gotten comfortable with those because your sponsor and your sponsor's sponsor has somehow given them an okay with those things. These other tools you haven't figured out how to pronounce yet, so you certainly haven't got your, um, your, your sponsor's okay, but somehow you're fine living with anxiety. I'm not anymore. So I understand how people screw things up 100% and a lot of these ideas get thrown off. The 12 steps, there's the 12 steps, those are the ideas. The meetings are... The, the meetings are forums to integrate the 12 steps into people's lives. That's the reason they were created. You walk into 12-step meetings, any random one, and you ask people, how many of you are doing the 12 steps? How many of you have read it? How many of you are working with a sponsor? It's usually less than 50%. That was my question. Right. So there are issues there. I'm saying there's 100% issues. The purpose of the 12 steps meetings is here's a book. It's the same problem with psychedelics is you do psychedelics and then, okay, so what do you do with these memories? Are they... or any ideas, they can, all sorts of ideas can come at us, you know, so I have an idea that, a recurring thing, that we're living in a simulation. Okay, fine. This is an idea that keeps coming up. What am I going to do with this idea? Am I going to turn this into me not taking life seriously because it's all a simulation? Be, you know, so that's why it's important we have people who help us integrate and they've been through, the, they've navigated these, these places for a while because so, these ideas and the practice of it, if we just read the Torah, and we don't have like the, what do they call it, the Mesorah, right? The idea, then we may think, okay, kill all the Amaleks, right? I mean, that's, who's Amalek? How do we know who it is? Just You can get a lot of different ideas from the book, so you also need the, so the purpose of the 12-step meetings is say, okay, we have these 12 steps, but how do we practice it in our life? How do we treat our wife differently as a result? When I'm in a fight with a, my business partner, how is that going to translate to these ideas? Do I cave? Do I, like, am I... A little more on this one of not controlling. Is it something I could or can't? So here you have a number of people and hopefully some who've been at this for a bunch of years who are saying, okay, this is how we integrate the steps into our lives. And that's the purpose of those meetings. Unfortunately, many people do the meetings but not the steps. So you have, there are, there are problems for sure. You know, human beings do human things. But overall, the message of the, message of the 12 steps, like I think is clean. Well, I think the 12 steps themselves are clean. And I think you said this before, the 12 steps are really applicable to anyone at any time and across many cultures. They're, they're just very basic rules for life, right? I'm talking more about the all-in approach because it takes a huge amount of courage or desperation to be able to say, I'm all in. And what happens to people who can't do that yet? So... Yeah, it's not for everyone. Right. 12, 100% so, everyone. so my approach is something like... I think for years I was very hard on myself. I'm a perfectionist. I go to the, the utmost. And I'm an all-in kind of person. And for me, a lot of my work has been, what if it didn't need to be that? What if I can... It's kind of like a tree. If you have a tree in your backyard, that's really not great. It's poison. It has to come down. Taking down a tree is hard. It's a lot of hard work, right? Chopping it down and getting mm. rid of everything. And then maybe you have to dig up the garden to get rid of the roots. But if you can go back in time... I'll to... show you some problems in my backyard okay. if you want to see some. <laughs> sure, I just love touching in trees. Yeah. I have some massive problems yeah. with trees. <laughs> okay, I see. I, I wasn't not bringing it up <laughs> for no reason. But if you can go back to the when the tree was a seed and just pluck it out of the earth, it becomes the easiest thing. Yeah. So my goal is, yes, I do believe you have to be all in. I'm not willing to work with anybody who isn't at a certain level of, I'm not wasting time with you. I'm not here for you to be a victim. I'm not here for you to cry. I mean, cry. Right. But that's not where it's going to get us to where we want to go. But for me, I just find that the biggest results often come like, yes, your motivation and your attitude has to be an all in attitude. Right. But my job as the facilitator 
is to help you find that smallest piece that's going to have the biggest results. And then the all-in attitude doesn't have to become something that you have to work so hard on. It just becomes this lifestyle that is automatic. It doesn't become something you have to do. It becomes something you want to do. It's something you get to do. Right. Okay. So I, right. This I, right. Okay. We've met people who are all in kind of people and they have this infectious kind of joy. And, you know, we wake up every morning and the first thing you say is Modani. If you're Jewish, that's what you're supposed yeah. to say. I don't know very many people who feel very grateful first thing in the morning when their alarm rings. And there are not very many people who can open their eyes and have that much gratitude in the beginning of a day. So when I'm not feeling gratitude in the beginning of the day, that tells me that it's not that like, come on, pump yourself up, be all in. Like I could do that, enough cups of coffee and I can get myself to be all in, right? I can, I can bring myself there or I can say, what needs to happen for me to wake up feeling like this day is really going to be a great Okay, I see, I see where we're missing ourselves. Okay, when I use the word all in, I don't mean it the way you mean all in. No, I know, I know in all in that you're willing to look at anything. You're willing to yeah, look at I all mean, of your shadows. Right, so it's like all in, like in poker, you say, okay, like all my chips are on the table. Correct. Like I'm fear game. Correct. Poker but you want. I don't think we're saying something so different because I think that the all in kind of people, they, the kind of people that you hear me describing are like, driven, motivated, they're that way because they're not afraid to put their chips on the table. They really live life from a full heart. They're not hiding in the shadows. So they have this abundant energy to live their life because if you're spending your life hiding or lying to yourself, you know how much energy that takes? So you wake up with half a battery. Oh yeah. So all in kind of people, right? To put your chips on the table. Yeah, it feels a lot, it feels hard because you have to get very up close with your shadows. But the payoff is that you get to live your life with a full heart that you really do wake up with more energy in the morning because you're not busy suppressing parts of yourself. So for me, if, if I can find all of those places inside, instead of making a decision that I'm all in, right, which takes a lot of effort, what if I can find those small places where I've forgotten how, how to be all in? Like, what if I find the place that I hid that part of me away when I hid it away and I can just bring one part out slowly and then tomorrow I wake up with just a little more than I had before it doesn't right. have to be this one moment. And you know what? I don't know that all of us are ready to go all in and look at all of our shadows. No, it's true. And this is another problem with the 12 steps as well. I mean, the 12 steps kind of has a problem at the end and at the beginning in some way, meaning the end is that like, this is, the journey's not over here. There's, there's definitely more. This is a, the 12 steps is, a, is 12 steps in a process. There's life afterwards, number one. But the other problem is that there's nothing to do with someone whose life is not a complete wreck. <laughs> right? so, Say more on that. <laughs> meaning the, the, the door to that space is desperation. Yes. Nobody who isn't desperate goes to the 12th Exactly. Steps. Meaning that, right. So, right. So the, the solution, it's not that nobody does because someone can come like, you, like we spoke about earlier. We, you can end up coming because a friend came or something else. But like the way I found it where I didn't know anybody who who was, I was really struggling. I I had this porn thing and, you know, sex addiction thing going on for a while, but I didn't view it as an addiction because I never tried to be in a relationship. I was married to my work and I'm just going to focus on work. And yeah, I did what I did and I had no reason to stop. I got into a relationship and for a few months I stop. And then all of a sudden I can't, you know, one thing pops up and and now it just snowballed out of control. And months later, I'm, you know, I'm lying constantly. I'm, um, all sorts of secrets going on. And it just felt completely, completely, completely unsustainable. So I go to a therapist who I'd spoke, who I'd seen earlier. And I said, hey, you know, this thing that we had spoken about a few times, which I said wasn't an issue, is actually a big freaking issue. I've done this, 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 that, that stop. And I'm recognizing that where I want to go, wanting to start a family. I mean, I can't stay faithful for 72 hours. This is crazy. So he mentions meanings and I was like, no, not that, you know, not that like he uses the word addiction. I had a really hard, my bottom was not what happened on the outside. It was what happened on the inside was reading a book about addiction and seeing that I met those like criteria that it means. And I was like, wow, it's that bad. Like, that's how bad this is. Cause I didn't drink. I didn't gamble. I didn't drug. So I had this whole story that, you know, everything's okay. And then once I was faced with this, it was, it's like, yeah, if I want to stay single forever and live this life forever, then it may be sustainable on some level or felt like it could have been. 
but if for what I want, this is, is it's impossible to, to get there. And he said, listen, I have a, another client, another patient who's into 12 steps. And if you want to talk to him, I spoke to him and he'd be happy to talk to you. And, you know, the call to him and then, you know, do I actually meet up with him and then go to a meeting in the middle of Fort Lauderdale where I don't know anyone that was, yeah, those are brutal things. And then to actually start, you know, what are people doing here? You know, it's like a sponsor. Okay, you know, you sit down the first time with that guy and he's poking everywhere nicely, but, oh, shoot, like that's what this is. And he says, yeah, if you want me to be your sponsor, like if that's what you want, I want you to come to three months of meetings every day for three months. I don't have time. He's like, you don't have time. You tell me to go to strip clubs every day. Like, well, how do, you, how do you not have time? You don't have time to do both, but maybe you can, you know, stop that and do this. So slowly those ideas I was willing to accept because, you know, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail. And eventually it's like, okay, it's the last house on the block. So that's the challenge with the 12 steps is that for someone who's slightly curious, wants to fix something, it doesn't, it doesn't have a solution to, to offer them. All right. All right, I feel so that's the 12 steps as a program versus if it was a lifestyle. Like why are we not teaching these concepts to kids from a very young age? Why are we not modeling these concepts? Sure. If we modeled them, if we really believe them, like when you said earlier about the word of God, right? People saying things in you know God's name that isn't, but if we could model to kids what really these paradigms mean, we would have much healthier people who wouldn't reach a point of desperation. Yeah, 100%, yeah. I feel like a lot of people who are lucky enough to, let's say, take on the ideas of the 12 steps, why did they have to get there out of desperation? Right? Why, why does it take desperation? This is a question I've, like, I've, I've wrestled with a lot. Like, is there a way, the question is really, like, is there a way to grow meaningfully without suffering? Yes. Yes, that's the... Yes. That's the question. I just think that people don't always want to because if you're not suffering, there's no catalyst. There's no motivating factor other than maybe boredom. Right. I mean, it's essentially the same question, meaning the desperation and the suffering is could we grow without, without suffering? Right. And I think like that... that's my prayer for myself now. Could I, have, could I continue growth without getting the hard messages from the universe? Like, could I hear those like whispers and then move or I need it to be a baton? So those whispers are all around us. Exactly. I don't always know how to interpret them, but just today I had two different whispers happen to me, and they were both joyful. They were so they were so awesome, and both of them let me know that I was in some way in the right direction, on the right path. But they were not from suffering. But they did make me look twice and say something's here. So one of them was before I came down here. My daughter had asked me randomly before I left the house. She's like, can you bring me back? And the thing she asked for was a spoon. She said, can you bring me back a spoon? And she was very specific about it. She said, can you bring me back a pink spoon? And she described it because she compared it to another spoon that I had in the house. And I said, what makes you think I'm going to get a spoon? She says, well, I don't know. There are probably like ice cream shops around. And I was like, I, I just, and I completely dismissed that. And then as I'm walking down the street, like ready, getting ready to leave uh, here, you know, to here, there was that spoon that she asked for. Asked for it was just on the pavement. I just, it was the strangest thing, and I was like, okay, Did something. You pick it up? I picked it up. Of course, I picked it up. <laughs> I picked it up. I'm going to bring it for her, but it was the strangest thing because something is there for me. There was there was no pain, right? Right. It's this cute little story, but it's not a nothing story. There's something there for me. My daughter needs. But this sensitivity to it is coming after suffering. So I've, it's my, but it's Florida. I'm wearing a hoodie. Right. Right. It's not suffering. It's this extra sensory ability. I feel, I hear everything. I notice everything. You can imagine that I suffer quite a lot to hear the things that other people don't hear. Like I can hear electric plugs charging. They, they, I can go crazy sometimes. So I think, I think suffering made me choose to look at it more instead of saying like, oh my gosh, it's, I'm sensory, it's such a hard way to live. It's like, but maybe this is telling me something, right? Right, but what I'm saying is for you individually, it's, mm -hmm. it was the suffering. And then let it led you to a place where hopefully you're picking up the small subtle signs like spoons. I, the question is for someone who right. So actually no, because so I mean, it's both. The question yeah. is both. So so let's say the spoon, right? I could have just laughed it off as a coincidence, or I could say no. That was the last thing that my daughter asked me something. She asked, there's something she wants, and it was such a random thing. So I'm not looking at what she asked, but there's some sort of connection. She wants something from me. She's asking from. 
She's asking something of her mother, which tells me I need, and that was a sign, like, oh, here I am being able to give that to her. So what is the that that she really needs? There was no suffering in that. There was only curiosity and joy. And before I get answer your question, I'll just tell you another one. So I've become obsessed with a certain book series lately, and it's not a new series. It was written in the 50s. And it's, I can't say it's obscure, but no one in my world has heard of it, right? So I'm, I'm diving in and I'm having a great time and I just can't believe that this has been written half a century ago. I'm in the Uber on the way here. And this guy turns around, he says, have you ever read this book? <laughs> and I'm like, what? And then he goes and we have this like hour long conversation where we're just analyzing this like, literary analysis of this book. And there's nobody in my life, there's <laughs> nobody in my life who has read the book, who will read the book. There's nobody who's, and he's giving me these very accurate depictions. I'm like, I can't believe you noticed that in the book because nobody else talks about that. And it's like, okay. And, and you know, I was kind of judging myself for reading the book because it's not a self-help book. It's kind of like a it's fantasy, it's science fiction. And I'm just like, if people knew I was reading that, it would be like, what? It's like, she's supposed to be reading, you know? <laughs> and I was like, okay, there's something in there for me. Now, this is literally what I teach. I teach people it shouldn't have to take you pain to be able to notice that you're in constant connection, constant conversation with the universe. What if you notice these things before you had to be in pain? So when I was diagnosed with cancer the first time, my doctor had told me, he said, you must have had a really hard year a year ago. And I said, yeah, how did you know? And he said, because the kind of cancer that I was diagnosed with, the year before that, I had Epstein-Barr, which is similar to mono, right? And he says, you know, one in a thousand patients with Epstein-Barr end up with the kind of cancer you have. But 50% of the people with the cancer you have have had Epstein-Barr within the year before. And he says, Epstein-Barr is a virus. Your body knows how to, how to get rid of it, unless your body is suppressed. So you're either immunosuppressed because you're not taking care of yourself or you're emotionally suppressed. And so therefore it can move into something greater. What if, and he didn't say it to me in a way to make me feel bad or make me feel guilty, but it was always like, wait, you mean I could have seen this coming? There were messages before this, and there were messages before that. And I feel like the universe is always talking to us in these gentle nudges and whispers, and it's, we're just very conditioned not to hear them, right? So you have kids, right? You have mm -hmm. any kids who are sensory? Because it's really common these days. I have one daughter who um is very reactive to, to loud noises okay. or things like that. So as a parent, what do you do about it? What do I do? Yeah. About it? I do whatever my wife says okay. when it comes to the kids. Good, very, good call. <laughs> good call. I'm finding that most people are viewing their kids as an issue, right? So they, they take their kid to therapy, right? They're trying to help this kid get some sort of sensory therapy and figure out, like, what is wrong with the kid. And to me, it's like, wait, maybe the kid is telling you that something is wrong in the environment. Like a lot of these sensory kids are actually really fine in nature. They're fine. They're not worried by loud noises in nature. They're actually really fine. Oh, interesting. Right? So they're, maybe they are heightened. They're, they're telling you something that you've completely numbed yourself out to see. Right? Because we live in an environment that how many times as a child were you told, it's, just, it's not a big deal, right? Or you fell down and you got a, a scratch and your parent told you that doesn't hurt. And it's like, right but it does hurt. But then they tell you it doesn't hurt. So you don't really know what to believe. So you distance yourself from your pain. You distance yourself from your senses. So then of course, by the time we're adults, the only thing that captures our attention is pain and trauma. And what if it didn't? What if it didn't have to? What if you could just notice the pink spoons on the sidewalk or the Uber driver who's... Who, okay, so that's right. right. So that's a question. This is a question that fascinates me is could we... Yes, this is what I teach. Right, could we I, raise the bottom, so to speak? Yes. Yeah. I believe so. And I also believe that that doesn't mean you're never going to be in pain. My life is not perfect. I have lots of things going on in my life, but I no longer define myself by the thing that I'm going through. I no longer see it as like, this is my story. It's just something that I'm dealing with. And sometimes people hear the stuff that are going on in my life and they're like, I, I, would, be, I would be shattered. Like, how are you functioning? And it's just like, cause it's not, it's just one thing. It's just one thing, but there are so many other magical things that are happening at the same time. And if my eyes are open to everything, then I get to choose what lens I see the world through. And I, this is literally what I teach. So this course, that Vessel, that I was talking to you about before, so it's an eight-module course. And, you know, the beginning is kind of heavy. We talk about, like, self-love, and we talk about shadows, and we talk about all that stuff. And module six is trauma. And people are waiting for module six. They're waiting to talk about trauma because you know that really most people who come into therapy, they want to talk about trauma in module one. They're just like, when am I going to talk about what happened to me? And then by the time I teach trauma, 
people are really surprised because it's not at all what they thought it was going to be. It's not about your story. It's about the impact that your story left on you. It's the pattern that now became set up in your brain. So it's those repetitive things that you're going to keep calling into your life because you never resolved some sort of thing that happened. Mm -hmm. and it's not the story. It's the underlying, let's call it soul pattern. So I think it's the higher lesson that you came to learn. So people end up having a great time with module six. It doesn't mean it's not e that it's easy. You know, it's, it's, it's stressful for some people, but it's usually a, a lot more freeing than they expected it to be. And then module seven is about manifestation. And people are like, wait, what? Like, what does that come in? It's a course on self-development. What does manifestation have to do with anything? And where manifestation comes in is, again, going back to who you were supposed to be. If you didn't have to define yourself by your story and what you've been through, if you can clear that, come back to who you're meant to be and who you're meant to be is the primordial man, right? So if you look in the Chumash in Genesis, the first words God ever spoke to mankind, right? So you hear God's voice and he created, but the first time he ever opened his man and spoke to Adam, he said, be fruitful and multiply. And what did he mean by that? Well, God created for six days and then the seventh day God rested. So what happened to the energy of creation, that constant movement that was in flow? God says to Adam, it's yours. Now you create, now you do it. And so that's who we are. We are creators. We create realities. I mean, you're Chabad, right? So Machshava, Dibor, Maisa, right? Right. you were raised on this. We were raised on this. We create realities. Most people who are in trauma don't feel that they create realities. They feel like they're a victim of circumstance. And the goal of all of this is to get you beyond that. Like if you can resolve this, you can come back to the truth of who you are. You are a creator. God has gifted you with the magic of creation. And you can create through your thoughts, through your speech, and through your actions. And so module seven is incredible. People are manifesting like crazy. And it's not like manifesting like a million dollars, although that has totally happened to me. I was walking in the street with my husband, and he was having this conversation with me. He says, you know, I have to send someone a hundred dollars, he says. And I don't know if I should send him a hundred because in gematria the 100 is the word sam which is poison so we don't like to do 100 hasidim like to send you know 101 we don't like to send 100 so i don't know if i should send the guy 100 bucks or 101 dollars and he's thinking about it. he's like because torah is also called sam chayim which is like the, the poison of life like medicine so i'm just he's like debating about this we, we get into deep philosophical like this this thing took like two blocks that he was thinking about this and as he's saying this out loud there's a, there's a 100 dollar bill right on the floor in front of him, like a crisp $100 bill. These things happen to us all the time. And as he picks up this $100 bill, he's like, okay, I'm gonna frame this. I'm gonna frame this. I'm gonna send this guy another 100, you know, I'm gonna quick pay here, so I'm gonna frame this bill. And he's getting ready to do that. And he's like, you know, I'm not gonna do that because if I frame this bill, then what I'm, what I'm telling God is like, oh my God, this was a miracle. He's like, this isn't a miracle. This is what creation is all about. We should be able to make money come out of thin air all of the time. You know, he's like, if I frame this and I take it off as a one off, like a one off thing, right. he says, this is not a one off. And I, I want people to see that. I, and when people end up doing the work with me, by the time they come to module seven, the stories that they are telling about the changes that they're seeing in their life, the things that are coming in for them, so I'm just gonna expand on what I said about the money a little bit more. I was teaching this to my kids because I think kids are the best. Kids will, t you know, kids believe in the tooth fairy. So why shouldn't they believe in this? And this is real, like these are the laws of creation. The tooth fairy, you're eventually gonna have to shatter that truth, it's not true. But if you can teach them something, you know, adults, when they're like, oh, you can manifest money out of thin air, we're just like, eh, whatever, I do believe it, I don't believe it, right? So adults are a harder sell. But children are not, I and mean, you can teach them to think that way. So there was once where I left my house, my kids were really young, and we passed a dollar bill on the floor. And I said, oh, look, God loves us. He gave us a dollar. And my son, who was like nine at the time, says, that doesn't mean God loves you. It means you don't love yourself. Because if you really loved yourself, you would believe you're worth way more money than that. And one dollar would be like, ma, you were only capable of bringing down one dollar. Like it could, the same God who gave you a dollar could give you a million. So I laughed. I was like, well, someone's picking up his lessons well. And about a year later, we were walking in the street, and it happened to have been Shabbos. And we walked past the same spot. And there was a wad of cash on the floor, like a thick wad of cash. And there were hundreds in that wad. And my son and I looked at each other, and it was Shabbos. And I just looked at him, and he looked at me. And he says, Ma, I love myself. I believe in myself. I believe that Hashem loves me. If this money is meant for me, and it is, because I'm the one who found it, it's going to be here, Master Shabbos. 
He walked back. There. This was in a public street. It was right there in the middle of the road. He, he walked there, Matzah Shabbos. It was $736. It was just <laughs> sitting there waiting for him. And then I was kind of feeling bad about it. And I was like, no, we're just going to put it on a sign. You know, if anyone lost a huge yeah. sum of money, we kept it there for 30 days. Nobody came to claim it. And my son taught me more about this. Like, I teach this to other people, but my kid showed it to me. You can. And it's not about the secret and manifesting with the things you want. It's about you're in constant connection with the universe at all times. So you're giving messages, you're receiving messages, but you have to be open to them. And most people are not because they're so blinded by their pain. They don't believe that they're creators of their reality. They don't believe in the magic of who they are. They have no, they have no idea. I just hired someone this way. We're going to see if it's going to work. Okay. Because we started the retreat center. I haven't told Tyler the story. You'll hear it now. Um, and I'm like, okay, we got to hire someone for it, but I don't want to go through the whole interview process. It just putting a job post out there, meeting 20 people, selecting it just, it, I was like, no, there's got to be a better way to hire someone. So I'm thinking like, you know, who should I call? Who should I call? And this idea popped in, like this name kept popping out of my head, but I knew she's a young mother with a couple of kids. There's no way she can do this job, but her name kept popping up in my head. So I, I reached out to her. I told her about it. I said, I don't, I'm not 100% sure why your name keeps popping up in my head, but maybe you know someone for this job. So the next day, she's, she reaches back out to me, and she says, you know, my sister-in-law told me like she wants to do something in, uh, in healing space. She has a job now, but um, I spoke to her about it, and she's interested in, uh, in talking. So it wasn't even a real interview. I just hired her. That's amazing. So we'll, <laughs> I'll yeah, see I mean, if it's... I think, I th I think a lot we of people... We have to see how the story progresses, but that's exactly how... Uh... So I think a lot of people would hear a story like that and say, whoa, he must be psychic, right? And for me, again, I don't like when people say that about me because, yeah, it's cool when one or two people say it about you, but at a certain point, you're like, no, you're, you're not hearing me. There's something deeper here. We are literally antennas, right? Every one of our major organs are actually electric. Your brain is electric, your heart is electric, and your nervous system are electric. So you're emitting frequencies at all times. And you're also receiving frequencies at all times. Now, if you're experiencing trauma, then your frequency is static, or your frequency is mayday, right? SOS. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, if you're emitting SOS frequencies, and you may not even be aware of it, because it's just a glitch in your system, then, of course, your whole life is going to be an SOS. It's, always, it's just going to be that. I feel like if you, if you can get back into alignment, right, then not only are you emitting positive frequencies, right, and people enjoy being around you, you're receiving things. So you were looking for a, you know, a job uh, position to be filled. You kind of emitted that thought into the world. But somebody out there was looking for the same thing. And so your wires cross paths. It's like a radio. So we are, we are radios. We are conductors from purely electrical space. So I feel like this is what people do not understand. I don't think that psychic stuff really exists in that way of like, woo woo, this is so not, this is so far fetched. I think this is the work that we're keen to do. We can live at a whole different plane of consciousness if you weren't constantly bogged down. So that brings me back to the stuff that we were discussing before. This work, if you think of this work, right, as being a fine tuned, if you think of yourself as a being, as being this fine tuned antenna, to pick up vibratory patterns because all of creation is vibration. Everything comes down to vibration. And so if you become this like being that can listen for attunement at all times, then the smallest thing, you know, so it would be so easy for you to have ignored that, that person's name that came into your mind. Right. right? We, we do that all the time. But it's like, no, no, what, what if that name brushed the, the figments of my mind for, what if I listened? Right? What if I did follow up? What if I didn't take that for granted? Most people have experiences like that all the time, and they just brush it off to coincidence. It's like, what if it's not coincidence? What if there was something there? What if you emitted frequencies that brushed against each other, and that was worth following up on because there was an alignment there? But so many of us don't follow that because what's yelling much louder is the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. So for me, all of this healing work shouldn't be about anger or resentment or forgiveness or all of those things are good. They're, they're important. They're integral parts of the process. But for me, the process is so much more of a process of attunement and fine tuning yourself. So let's say when it comes to, um, when it comes to music, right? My, my kids, they listen to electrical music these days, right? To them, music is DJ stuff. 
And I'm like, no, there is a, there is a beauty in a stringed instrument where you can get the vibration just so. And there's something coming out of that instrument that you cannot replicate with digital sound. You just can't. And somebody who plays a, an instrument understands the, the preciousness of the attunement and of, of noticing the fine details, not just of the instrument, but the movements and how you play it. And like, if you're playing a flute, your breath has to be perfect, right? So you're, you're focusing not just on the finger movements, but on your breath and on mm -hmm. your tone and all of that and how you hold your body. And there's an attunement process happening. So I feel like sometimes when people look at healing, there's just like, like you say, this overhaul. And it's like, yeah, but then you smash the cello. And I don't know if you'll ever make beautiful music again. <laughs> right. I understand. You know, I'm thinking if there's something that like um, almost everything has to kind of live in a contradiction a little bit. Oh, of course, you because know, so, we're all on a spectrum. Right. And I'm thinking if there's something unfinished about what I was saying there in terms of the years, because normally I wouldn't make a point like that. I was making it. A, I was making a point to say just to be more optimistic about the pattern, like what should be expected from so many people, which have like just in the infancy of the healing process, but to make it sound like three years or five years is some magic number isn't completely correct. But, you know, through my own um, process, this especially with psychedelics, because, you know, I, I've worked with different people in psychedelics and some are very intent on you having, some of the facilitators very intent on you having some like crazy breakthrough. And what a breakthrough could look like is, I don't know, vomiting, yelling, like some extreme, extreme thing. And for a while I was going through this, I don't know, this kind of like pattern like over and over with, it was like for about a year, like through it where some experiences were very gentle and some were very, very, very violent and back and forth and back and forth. And then um, I went to Costa Rica for a psychedelic experience. And I was thinking like, okay, I can just use something like my intention coming in, just like really mild, really gentle, really, you know, lower dose, just like reconnect nature, nothing, nothing violent, nothing crazy, you know, it's like that. And I show up um, to the guy I'm supposed to work with. And he's like, I want you to meet a friend. And this guy sits down with me, puts a bottle of ayahuasca on the table in front of me. And I wasn't planning on doing ayahuasca. Puts a bottle of ayahuasca on the table in front of me and says, um, he's like, if you want, it's an opportunity. It's a friend of mine who's a local shaman. I invited him. Um, maybe you'll, uh, maybe you want to work with him. And I was like, ooh, it's like so tempting, right? Like here I could have like a one-on-one -on -one ayahuasca experience in Costa Rica. Like, wow, like the healing I can do. You know, in this. And he's like, yeah, well, like, both of us will be here and, you know, anything you need. And, like, so the two voices in my head were one was I came in here with an intention. And this is not, doesn't match that at all. The other one was could I get some really, really deep healing done now in a way that I've never done before? Who gets the opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one ayahuasca experience or really two-on-one, -on -one, like two people? And I was like, wow, this could be, this could be amazing. Um... And I wrestled with it for a while. It got so intense at some point, just my back and forth, that I said, I'm leaving. I'm just like going to a hotel, I'm not doing anything. And then finally I said, you know what? I came with a specific intention. Like, that's what it, that's what it is. And I went in super gentle um, experience, super gentle mushroom experience, very low dose. And um, I guess as soon as it, like, the medicine hit me, I was like, right choice, right choice. And... Like the violence that was waiting for you was like it's extreme. And kind of the, the two voices that I rest with is one is does healing need to be violent and aggressive? Or the the phrase that I had at the end of it that I wrote down is like we need to heal from the idea of healing fast. And it's like that was like the 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 breakthrough. So I did wanna layer that on top of that kind of three to five year idea because it feels incomplete to say something like that. I don't want someone hearing that and saying, oh, am I three years, am I five years? No, something can happen today that can be exactly where someone needs to be and everything is just fine. Um, that point stands in a certain place that early on in the process of, you know, the collective jumping on board, I'm not expecting that that much. Even psychedelics, I, mean, I, 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 I started speaking about it, but... I said one conference, I said, I've, I feel like I'm someone who's had sex two times and I'm talking about sex because the rest of the crowd hasn't had it. 
you know? So it's like, I have no business talking about the subject. I'm like, I've had my first ayahuasca experience four years ago. Like what business do I have talking about these tools? On the other hand, there isn't any, right? right. There, there's anyone else. So let me, let me give the subject some, hopefully in one conversation it's hard to give it a full spectrum, but hopefully for someone who listens um, generally to me, they get a more full um, idea of where like that on the subject. But yeah, some of it certainly feels, feels that way. It's completely inappropriate for someone, but in a place where there isn't others. So I'll, uh, I'll, yeah. s- I'll stand sure. up. I feel like in the world in general, we've become focused on progress and we've lost the joy in process. Yes. And when I was first diagnosed, I remember asking my doctor, I'm going to be the best patient you ever had. Like I'm, like I said, I'm a perfectionist. I'm going to do it right. <laughs> and I said, just tell me a date when this is all going to be over. And he got quiet for a minute and he says, there are two answers I can give you, right? He says, number one, I can give you the protocol answer. We're going to take chemo on these and these days. And if everything goes well, I'll circle a date on the calendar and hopefully it'll be done by then. He says, but that's not the answer that, he says, I know you. And that's not why you're asking the question. And that's not an answer that's going to satisfy you. You want a real answer. And the real answer is it's never over. It's never over. There will never be a day in your life that you will not say modani in the morning and be grateful that you're healthy today because there was a time where you didn't know that you, you would live to see your 17th birthday, you know? So he says, that's the way this works. You will, all, this will always be something for you. So he says, the mistake that I see people make is that they come in here and they ask that question. And what they tell themselves is, I'm gonna put my life on hold until that day when I'm declared in remission. He says, but your life is happening right now. Right. This is part of your life. And you may not like it. You may not like coming to the hospital. You may not going like not like going to meetings, but this is it. There is no more than this. People keep asking me all the time, "When will I be healed?" There is no healed. Life has ups and downs. There is only this moment. If this is the only moment you ever have, can you make the most of this moment without judging it? So whatever you're doing in this moment, where you're going, whether you're going skydiving or you're with your spouse or you're in an AA meeting. Can you view this moment as the ultimate moment in 6,000 years of creation? Every moment of creation led to this moment. Can you view this moment, no matter what you're doing at this time, as the pinnacle of creation God needed 6,000 years to bring this moment to happen right now? And people, it's, it's hard for people to grasp it, that this moment is exactly where you need to be. Right. You're never going to be healed. You'll only be here. Right. And that, like this... That was why I worded in that way. We have to heal from this idea, meaning one of the toxic ideas that we've acquired somehow is that healing has to be violent and that healing is a, like, a, 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 like a, play, a place that we... We think that the healing has to be as violent as, as what hurts you. You know when they say what goes in must come out? Right. And it's like, well, it, it went in violently. It has to come out violently. And I don't know that that's true. Right. You know what's... Um, it was like during that experience, it was like, you know, I'm kind of like a sucker for new stuff. And I said, um, I had this idea on that. I was like, hey, maybe we can try new medicine. Let's ask the same shaman, right? Does he, maybe tomorrow he can come back with something I've never tried before. So sure enough, we did. And the next day he came back. And during that, I, like what I imagined was, like I've thought of like the healing process as cleaning out. So was maybe instead of imagining like a fire hose cleaning me out, I can imagine a feather just kind of slowly like <laughs> brushing things away. And for a long time, oh, whatever, time doesn't matter in that space, but for a long time, I just like lied there, just imagining feathers like gently, gently cleaning off anything that was irrelevant. It's like I'm done with the fire hoses. So it's good. I'm glad we spoke because it brought me back to, to that, um, and like the awareness to, of that, yeah, that I wanna, journey. I want to bring a point to you is that, you know, before you were talking about the 12 steps and the program and how it t- took you about three years to land on your feet or to feel that you had landed on your feet, right? But the moment that you're describing, that moment of having made that choice, right? That's a defining moment. And I think what people are waiting for is what, you're sh- what you shared earlier, like, oh, that feeling of I'm landing on my feet, I'm, I'm finally living, right? And you're right, it could take about three years, probably if you're, if you're committed to the program, you could, it will probably be around three years before you feel that, that you're really on the ground. Right. Another way of saying it is that I trusted myself. 
Like yes. during that process I was dating, I was like, could I commit? Is it me who's committing? Because what I was finding was that I'd, I'd come to a space where I felt so certain, I felt so clear, and then something new would come at me and I wouldn't be able to handle it. And I was like, well, I thought I was here. I thought I overcame this, you know? And it wasn't like there wasn't growth through that. During that process, um, I had, you know, a lot of things were changing in my business. I was sponsoring people. I was seeing their growth and stuff like that. But I, I didn't get to that space of trusting myself that, like, I could withstand a punch from here. Right. Right. That's. And yet you had these moments. Huge moment. Huge. Yeah. And that, like, choosing not to go with the medicine. Right. That was offered you. Oh, that. Yeah. This yeah. was. Yeah, it does, more, but yeah, yeah. A moment like that. Right. And people don't appreciate that those moments are like gifts. Like, no, work, the work that you're doing, that this is it. Like, this is it. It's being able to make a choice. I want to go a little lighter than a little heavier, you know? People are waiting for that day where they feel like, oh, I got my feet on the ground. And it's like, I don't know that I always have my feet on the ground. Life is, is full of surprises, and I, got, I get knocked down a lot. But I stop minding it so much. I stop minding getting knocked down. I don't make it a life sentence. And it just becomes this moment of like, okay, well, I, can I appreciate the moments where I got up? Or the, appreciate the moments where I just swayed a little bit? Or appreciate the moments that it didn't phase me at all, where you know the punch just missed me and it was fine. I didn't even see it coming. And I walked on. Right. People are just not noticing that healing is such a, a broader spectrum of experience. And I think what it really does is it broadens your life experience, where what you just shared was probably in the beginning of your journey. It was, okay, addiction bad, right? So like porn is bad. Right. And probably anything that could have led you into porn is bad. Right. Right. Versus you come to a place in your life where you're like, I'm not triggered by these things anymore. So I don't necessarily need to live my life in fear of avoiding the things that may trigger me, right? In the beginning, you may. Yeah, 100%. Right. right. So I think a lot about healing is just about ex expanding your band bandwidth again so that you can come at life wholeheartedly where you don't have to live in fear or you know, either get pulled into an addiction or live in fear of being pulled into an addiction. I think there's a, there's a place in the middle of... I'm open to life as it comes. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the challenges that I do have with the 12 steps, which I don't think is 12 steps, 12 steps, but the way the meaning has got, like, once an addict, always an addict. It's like, come on. like that. At some point, that becomes, it becomes exhausting and it becomes unnecessary. Like, really? You've been sober for 20 years. You're sure? The people say it. People say it. You've been it. sober longer than you've been an addict. Yes. Yeah. And they'll say it because they're repeating something. I'm like, okay, that was an idea that was very important to hold because the space you were in 20 years ago was one that can find any crack that can get to the drink. Right. So the, your, whoever it was wanted to seal that off. Like, no, there's not a time, there's not a space, there's nothing. Zero alcohol ever. Never, never. Right? And you're always going to be like this. Because, so that's like seal that off completely because that space was necessary because every single loophole is being looked out for. Right. You know, like a lot of people find when they early um, addiction, like when this, it's really when, when someone is thinking like, oh, that's my problem. My problem is alcohol. Why do they even have alcohol stores? You know, right. like, so, so what a lot of people find is that they find other addictions, you know, right. because the mind is just desperate for the escape and it's searching everywhere. So in that space, it's very important to lock it down for someone and it's locked down with absolutes. And then f someone finds major reprieve from that. It's like, oh, wow, this is so cool. Like, no porn at all, zero. Nothing that looks like, none. Instagram also, none. Facebook, none. Nothing, zero, done. Google images, get it off your computer. Tell your IT to put, oh, this is amazing. I feel so free. And then when someone starts feeling that way, and it's like, oh, wow, this gave me so much peace. 20 years later, they're repeating the same idea, but you're not in the same space. Right. Like, so, um, all right, I understand those I understand those things. And then you see the other side of it. I got an email from someone. We're going back and forth for the last week. And he's like, yeah, I realize that I can use um, meetings, but will I have to go to them forever? I'm like, the only thing that's going to be forever if you don't do anything is, is your addiction. point. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. that's going to be the forever. Like, you're really worried about forever, forever, but that's unfortunate. Meaning, so someone can take any of these ideas, and yet it's forever for a period of time. <laughs> wow okay <laughs> right like that, meaning, that right you have to embark on that forever and obviously there's different things right porn could be forever but it's not about the porn it's about the stuff that would throw me off right you know I go i went to a house showing once um, my, my wife and i were looking by for a house uh, looking to buy a home and everywhere there was porn images and threw me off for a couple of days one time i went to um a restaurant it was like this french bistro 
and I went to the bathroom. I was, you know, in the urinal, and I looked up, and right in front of me is this, like, very graphic image. And it was nothing to do, right? I'm kind of, like, kind of there. So because I told myself I'm an addict, because I was still in that space, I allowed myself to say, like, this... This is a trigger, and there's right, fear around trigger, it. Right, there's a trigger. This affected right. me. Now I'm off, and I'm talking to the manager about the porn in his bathroom. Right. And, you know, instead of just like, okay, this was stupid, I can just go back right, to my dinner. Right. Today would be like, okay, it's there. It's not. It doesn't have to right. throw me off, and I don't have to um, run after it. Or you know, an old timer saying maybe in AA is, I don't think about drinking. I don't think about not drinking. Right. right? It just doesn't <laughs> enter my consciousness. Right. It's just not. It's just not there. And if someone has a drink, it's not. It's drink in front of me. It's not the end of the world. Even if I see someone drunk in front of me, it's not the end of the world. I don't have opinions about everyone's alcohol consumption. Right, right like which I brings me back try. to the thing I was saying before. Part of healing is the, being, the ability to acknowledge what is, right? It is people drink, people have, you know, people have sex, people enjoy porn or whatever it is. Can I acknowledge that without getting personally involved or invested? That's, I think that's a big foundation to, right. to acknowledging growth. It's like, am, do I have the ability to just acknowledge what is? Right, just what I get sensitive to, and I guess it's with any of these conversations, is that, you know, as I'm saying things that sound like they're critical of the 12 steps or the meetings or the way it can be expressed, then someone who today can really benefit from that is saying, I don't want it because of that reason I heard on this podcast that, you know, people can get stuck there for 20 years. Deal with today. Right. Right. Yeah, I think, I think that, again, that, that's going to bring us back to something that we had spoken about, like, way in the beginning of the podcast, that this isn't about this one thing is going to save you. If you, if you come back to the idea, what is all of this meant to do? It's meant to bring you back into alignment with who you're supposed to be. So it's not meant to take you from addict to non-addict. It's supposed to take you to the place where you're not even thinking about these things so you do have the freedom to become who you were always meant to be. Right. So if you can appreciate what the 12 steps is giving you right now because this is the moment you need it, then by all means, use anything at your disposal. I mean, look, I'm coming from, from the perspective of chemotherapy is poison. It's really bad for you. Right. But, you but if you need to do it because it's going to save your life, you do it. So I'm not, a, I'm not here to judge whatever someone needs as long as you don't lose sight of what you're really doing this for. And you're not doing this to free yourself from porn. You're doing this so that you have the freedom to remember who you are. Right. I like that. So when you're ready to, when, when you recognize that the 12 steps have gotten you where you needed to go, don't be afraid to take the next step, which may be out of the program into something we don't know. Right? right. Yeah. And for some people it is, some people it's not, you know, I had a sponsor and the last sponsor I had who for years, he's just sponsoring 15, 20 people at a time. He's retired and this is his life and this is what he wants to do. And he found all his purpose there. And for, as I started kind of looking outside of the meetings, I was just being pulled to different places and uh, they felt more right than all of my service happening in there. I had some of these voices in my head, like, am I, am I doing something wrong for the 12 steps? And eventually I just, like, this talks about service. Service is... Service. Yeah, service, service. And if this, this is what's lighting me up, this is what I'm... Uh, I remember my doctor uh -huh. telling me, he's like, you're going to be a doctor. And I so badly wanted to be a doctor because I wanted <laughs> to do what he did. And I really, I had this passion of just going to medical school and helping kids with cancer. And then, of course, that changed my mind a million times. And I kept thinking, like, I didn't know what to do with myself when I needed to enroll in college. I was like, I haven't figured out what it is that I want to do. Do I want to go into medicine? Do I want to go into psychology? I didn't know. But if I look back to, like, so I didn't become a doctor, but what, it, what was it that I loved about that experience Well, when my doctor told me, like, when I, when I looked at him, I said, I want to be like you. I wanted to help people remember who they are. Like one of the things that we say when someone finishes chemo is that they're in remission, right? So any, any word in the English language that begins with the word R-E, right, is that we've brought something back, right. right? So remission is when every cell in your body remembers its mission. Its mission is aliveness. Its mission is health. So remission is when we've remissioned your whole body. All of your cells, instead of going in the cancer direction, they're like, oh, that was, a, that was a, a wrong move. We're supposed to you know, navigate this. We're supposed to bring more aliveness to this person. So I, I realized that that's my passion. My passion is remission. It's remembering. And remembering is also when we reclaim parts of ourselves that we have disassociated or disconnecting from, and we member them, we bring them back. Right. Right? So I feel like at the end of the day, you say like acts of service, you did become a sponsor. You're sponsoring thousands of people who listen to your podcast by giving them the tools that they need, maybe in a different way. And I feel like I do the same. I'm here to help people become into remission, remember their mission here. Beautiful. 
So you mentioned that just before, this was offline, that um, just before I reached out to you, which I first heard about you on the podcast with Mayor Kay, but then in the last, I don't know, last the week before I emailed you, your name came up a couple of times. So if it feels right, I go for it. And um, But you had said the day before you had made some sort of commitment to yes. do more of these. So what's that about? What is it? What is that that's changing in your life that you're embracing here? So I'm an introvert. I get nervous before I have to talk to people. You saw that before the podcast. I was legitimately shaking. I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> and I've done thousands of public speaking events, and it's hard for me each time. I learned, I, when I was in school, I struggled because I, I really did not know that I was smart, which was really strange when people meet me. They're like, you didn't know? Because I didn't do well in the traditional school system. So I sometimes would retain crazy amounts of information, but I didn't do well on tests, right? Or I had a slight form of dyslexia, so I was reading English beautifully, but it came to Hebrew and I, I couldn't do it. Till today, I, I can't read Hebrew. I, I, I read, but I can't, I can't s s say Hebrew words out loud. I will literally just stumble. Your Hebrew goes backwards. My Hebrew goes backwards. I'm <laughs> slight, slightly dyslexic. It's probably because my name. name is backwards. That, yeah. That's what it was, yeah. yeah. Um, so I really, I really struggled with that, that whole, like, am I smart? Am I not smart? And then, and then it was only after I left school and then I started pursuing my passions. My passions were not, oh, I'm passionate about this. It was just what, what was alive in me. So all of the work that I did, it was because something in me said, hey, this is out of alignment. I want to learn more about this. Why are people not seeing this, right? All of these patterns that I was seeing. And I was like, I want to know more. And then that led me into me doing a bunch of different things. And then I got known for all of the things that I was doing. And life started feeling a little bit, on the one hand, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that I can do all of those things for people and I can give that. But I became very boxed in to the roles that I play for people. And I haven't, I realized that in the last two years or so, I lost all of my creativity. I'm artistic and I, I play a bunch of different instruments and I haven't done anything in two years. I mean, I had a baby, so I've done. Right. But, but I haven't created art. I haven't played music. I haven't even listened to music beyond the breathwork sessions that I put together playlists. And something has been missing and I've been trying to piece it together. So my health wasn't great. I told you I had cancer again last year. That was my second bout. So I had a lot of pressing stuff that I had to deal with. But <coughs> a, a lot of my questions were, how do I get back to what ignites me and right. what my way of learning, right? And I realized how I learn best is through conversations with people. It's through life experience. I was very affected by the book, by the movie Slumdog Millionaire. Okay, yeah. Right? Like so that. everyone should watch it. We don't have to talk about the topic. Right. right. But basically the idea of Slumdog Millionaire is this little kid. You know, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, mm -hmm. an Indian kid and he's on the show Who Wants to Become a Millionaire? And they keep asking him these questions that are designed to make him fail. And he gets every single one right. And the back room of the TV show is like, this kid is cheating. There's no way. There's no way that he has the level of education required to answer all of these questions correctly. So they're sure that he's going to cheat them out of a million dollar prize. So the movie keeps giving you flashbacks to the life that this kid lived growing up in the streets. So he grew up in the slums. He was abandoned by his parents. And so every time there was a question that was asked that he answered correctly on the show, you get this scene from earlier in his life where how did he stumble upon this information? And that movie really affected me because I believe that. I believe that you get everything you need. You, the, the things that you really master are not necessarily the things you learned in school or the things you've studied. So yeah, I didn't really enjoy school growing up. And when it came time to pick high schools for my kids, right, I wasn't looking at academics because when, when people want to learn, they learn you probably don't remember the name of your ninth grade teacher or what they taught you, right? You might remember some things, but you know, like, like you were, if, if I ask you to point to where Texas is on a map, you can point there, but you right. may not necessarily remember who taught it to you, okay. right? So like if you go back to your high school years, what do you remember? You remember your emotions, you remember the, those defining experience, whether they were positive experiences or negative experiences. You, you remember your interactions with people that left an impression on you. You do not remember learning the Gemara that you learned. You probably don't remember right. which one you learned in 10th grade, 100%. right? So I realized that most of my defining moments have come from life experience. And I have robbed myself or I've allowed myself to be robbed of life experience the minute I became pigeonholed into my offerings or my skills. 
So when people say, well, she's a breath worker, right? And then all of my days are back to back breath work. And I love breath work, don't get me wrong, but I forgot what got me into breath work. What got me into breath work was the joy of breath, the joy of relating to my, to this essence. That's the exhale of God. And I've been trying to give that over to other people. And that's why other people like working with me, but I've lost my creativity in the process because I've forgotten that, you know, at the end of the day, I'm an introvert. I didn't go into breath work or hypnosis or I didn't go to sex school to give people this. Like I went for myself because I wanted to learn it. I'm grateful that I was able to turn those things into catalysts for other people. Right, but, but now it's time to learn more. Right, and I realize how am I going to learn more? So for a while, I've been enrolling in new courses or learning and every time I come, I'm like, why did I do this? I'm like, I'm not learning anything new. Like every course teaches you maybe one nugget. Like after your first training, your first training changes your world. Maybe your second training adds to that, especially if it's in another field. Yeah. And then at a certain point, you're like, I, all of these are interdisciplinary. They all come from the same blueprint. So every new training is going to give you one nugget, maybe two. And I'm like, I'm spending thousands of dollars for this nugget. Is this enough? And I'm like, this is not feeding me. How do I learn best? And I looked over my childhood experiences. I looked over my schooling. I looked over just the trajectory of my life. And I'm like, I learn best when I talk to interesting people. So that was my decision this year. There are 52 weeks in a year, and I want to have 52 interesting conversations. Okay. And then the next day you reached out. Oh, cool. And I was like, okay, I'm betting we're going to have an interesting conversation. How do we do? Well, I think we're going to have to decide that after the edit. <laughs> <laughs> after the edit? Well, I don't know. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I think we'll let the audience decide. Yeah. I think also it's hard to know in the moment of a, con a conversation what the conversation actually gave you. It's more upon reflection or as it lands for right. you. Or what I tell people a lot after working with me, especially because I'm a fan of the one degree movement, right? Right. They're like, what happens next? I'm like, wait. And one of my friends who's also in the healing world, she tells me, we tell clients to look for oopses out of patterns. Oops. Oh, I so you just, you just go and you live your life and then maybe set a date on the calendar, maybe in a week from now or in a month from now, and put an, put an alarm there. And when that alarm rings, look over the last month and say, huh, I wonder if anything changed in my life as a result of the conversation I had with Ellie, right? And you only know that because it's a right, one degree shift. So yeah. I guess I'll let you know by the time this podcast is released, right. we'll, we'll have yeah, a better this. idea of what, what yeah. actually changed. I had a guy call me um, last week and he says um, that when he was a child, he inappropriately touched his niece. And he's really struggling with the guilt associated with it, but he's like, does he bring it up? Does he not bring it up? You mean my uncle called you? No, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that feels like everybody's story. Yeah, this was more, I think, a, a cousin or yeah, relative, okay, but yeah. it was, he, he was young and she was young. But today, as he's older, he's racked with guilt, you know, and he said, you know, I finally realized, like, I guess I'm not an abuser, just what happened then, but like, maybe I ruined her life, maybe I didn't, do I bring it up with her, do I not? So um, I shared with him that, you know, in, in the 12 steps, which is where I, I learned a lot of, you know, these ways of life. Like I say, like, there's a lot of ideas that show up in different places. So you have step eight and nine with deal with amends. So step eight is made a list of all people we had harmed and became ready to make amends to them all. So it's not actually doing anything. It's an internal process of becoming fully ready to make amends to that person. So I said, do you feel fully ready to, to make it right with her? So he said, yeah, like I, if I talk to her, I'll pair therapy, like whatever I have to do. So I said, okay, so the second one, like step nine, the second part of this um, step is made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. So this one you can't do. Right. You, you, because you don't know. You may injure them. So you don't make direct amends. But you do something. So I said, I'll tell you something my sponsor taught me, and it helped me. So I said, I was running, so I said, I'll just give you what I did, and then go ahead and do it. You can call me back afterwards, after you do it. So um, I shared that what I had done once where um, I didn't make amends to someone who was now in, in a marriage, in a relationship, you know, and it was someone I had dated previously, and I felt like, okay, this is something I got to clean up, but I'm not going to reach out to someone with, you know, <laughs> a few kids and a husband like it's completely inappropriate but it was still something that I felt inside that I had to I had to make right so I brought up with my sponsor who took me through the same process and he said why don't you write a letter you'll read it to me and you'll burn it 
but write a letter to her and then you'll read it to me and and burn it so I go okay so I burnt it so I, I we went through the process and wrote it and you know you can't say that you know he he edited a bunch of things he helped me with it more than just editing but like where did that come from that's not appropriate like put this in so we went through it and then I read it to him and he's like okay now burn it and just let it go give it to God I'm like okay and um a month later I mean, this was like something that happened you know from when I was a teenager and this story I'm telling you happened three or four years ago. So you're talking 15, 16, 17 years of path. A month later, I get a call from her husband saying, uh, my wife is interested in talking to you. Are you okay? Are you okay sitting down with her? I'm like, oh, that's weird. So I said, um, I said, let me check with my wife. She's cold in here. So I did and ended up meeting with her and whatever. It was interesting. And then I shared with her the letter that I had written because I also had it on my phone. I shared it with it and, and that was that. So I told... I just, so I, I just told this guy, just burn the letter. Like, what more can you do? You've done your part. Give it to God and, and see what happens. So he sends me a message yesterday. He goes, okay, I did it and nothing happened. <laughs> I didn't tell him the other part of the, right. I, the other part of the I did it and nothing happened. <laughs> right, just, like, that was it. Right. There was nothing was meant to yes. happen. It's like, you did it, that's it, let it go. Right, what do you, you did, feel differently? You did the best you could. If something yeah. more is needed, it'll show up. Yeah. And if it's not, then just let it go. You've done your part. Yeah, and I think also the, the idea of closure is a myth, right? So we, we say this word a lot, and we're looking for someone else to give us closure. And it's like, no, closure is something that happens inside of you when you've made a decision to take accountability. or It's, right. not, it's not an action. It's a decision, right, to, to close something open inside of you. Right. It's easier said than done, but... No, especially some... Uh, this one's a big one. You know, this gets a... People get racked with terrible guilt over this thing, and, you know, it's a lot. Yeah, I don't think guilt is the worst thing in the world. Um, I mean, it's a hard thing to live with. Sure. I mean, guilt, yeah. I think, I think a lot of what people look for is absolution, and it's like, but well, also accountability. Like, sometimes living with a little bit of guilt. I'm not saying it's healthy or it's good in right. the long term, but I think a lot of people, let's say, let's say when, in the case of this guy who, who texted you or emailed you, yeah. right? So what he was looking for was absolution. He has this guilt, and he's hoping to take it to the person that he harmed in the hope of making things right, getting her validation that now things are okay, and he can walk away without the guilt. But then what do you do by that? You harmed someone, right? You, you basically, whether... You transferred your guilt onto them, maybe? Yeah, because let's say, let's say, forget it, let's say she did know, right? Let's, let's say yeah. it was in her consciousness. So we didn't have to worry about, uh, yeah, about her triggering her, right? But it's more that you took your guilt that was yours to work through, and you made her responsible now for giving you the forgiveness. So you hurt her, and now you need something from her. And it's like, maybe the guilt is not about her, and it's something that is just letting you know about decisions that you have to make for yourself. Right. I think the a lot of uh, new age stuff is like, we're just going to clear, and we're going to talk about everything together, and now there's going to be no secrets between us. And now we can, you know, when we say a, a burden shared is a burden halved, mm -hmm. I don't always think so. All right, sometimes, all right, sometimes it can become something yeah. on someone. The 12 steps is careful to use the word amends. Yeah. Right? We're there to make it right. We're not there yeah. to apologize. We're not there to get f anything from that forgiveness. And that was when I mentioned my sponsor helped me clean up some of those things. Like, I, She doesn't care where you were at at the time. She doesn't care what you've done since. Right. Like That's not right. you. This is accepting responsibility for what was done, acknowledging that those are things that you know was done, acknowledging that there may have been more that you don't know that was done, and then with ending with a very simple question: How do I make it right? Right. That's it. So that's acknowledging what is, taking responsibility, and making a movement. Oh yeah. Those three yeah, things. Perfect. Yeah. It, comes, it always comes down to that. Right. Oh, neat. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just yeah. <laughs> like I mentioned, nothing happened. I was like, "What do you want to happen? <laughs> like the house to blow up? Like right? What you were have you no idea what you have no idea what happened. Right. It didn't happen. So now, now I need to ask you a question. Go ahead. So your podcast is called In Search of More. Yeah. And I, I wanted to know why, what does the search mean to you? Because my workshop is called IA, which is the search. What is it in search? It says in search of self. self. Um, I just felt like that was my... What is the more? Like, what is the search? What, is, what does that mean for you? It's, it's, it's more, it's not the, the emphasis is not on the more, it's on the in search, like staying in the space of constantly searching, constantly asking questions because... I feel like that's like over time, looking back, like that's what I've offered where a lot of people, when I went into business and there was a lot that came from that, 
uh, the question, and you know, I'm surrounded. Once you know, you get to a certain place, and you're surrounded by people who are in that place. I'm doing business with people who are making money, and you know, better cars, better houses, better um, lives, more charity, whatever it is. And the voice in my head is like, "Is this it? Is this it?" You know. And then pushing there, and then as I start opening some doors, years later, seeing some of the people who thought I was c completely crazy, but why are you doing that? Why are you? What do you care about these meetings therapy? You can make so much money. Like, wh why don't you focus here? But then, ten years later, them reaching out to me, like, dude, my marriage is wrecked. Like, you know, <laughs> so on. So it's like, okay, that willingness to open doors, say, is there more? And then within, this is just a couple examples. But then within twelve steps is being surrounded by people who made this their life. And I'm like, but is, is there, there more? more? Is there more? And then that happening as well, where as I start in this process, you know, someone who's we're like, hey, you know, I've, I've been at this for a while, but there's got to be something, something more. So it's just a reminder, this isn't about asking any, it's not any specific answers for people. It's more just being very comfortable um, in the search That's and a reminder that, I don't want to speak from a pedestal. I don't want to speak from a place of, um, I found some solutions. There's a, um, a question. I have strong opinions, but uh, Ray Dalio says, um, I think strong convictions loosely held. Like, I like that. This is like everything that I know up till now has led me to conclusion that this is true. And I remain completely open to any feedback to move me off of this position. I'm not married to it, but I believe this strongly right now i love that so that's that's kind of been my uh mm -hmm. my process Did that answer your question yeah it's it's very much what i would have said that i wanted to hear what your thoughts were around i'm like yeah that's that's kind of where i, I feel like you're, i'm still on seeing you're in uh, search of in self search of self because the workshops that i run are the brand is called ia and in in torah ia is like ia makam kvodo so it's the search for the divine what IA is to know no ia is to seek where to seek Right? Or when God says, I Sara Ishtacha, where's Sarah where is? your wife? Right? Okay. Where? So it's the search. It's the seeking of the divine. It's the seeking of the feminine. And uh, for me, it's always, it's never about the answers. I think in general, Judaism is about questions, right? Yeah, 100%. And we, we literally create a Pesach Seder to encourage people to ask questions, kids to ask questions. So for me, it's always, all of this work is never about finding answers. I think, again, when it comes to healing, people are like, well, when am I going to be healed? When am I going to know? When am I going to have answers? And it's like, you'll know when you finally start feeling comfortable asking questions and not needing answers. Right. That's the moment you're looking for, this open-ended question. Yeah, and then being very comfortable with contradictions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah. I had one of the most violent um, psychedelic journeys I had was I was going through a process, and I was like, oh, that's it. Like, I got it. And then it was like, no, it's not. Oh. And... And I was like, oh, okay, but now I got it. I was like, no, it's not. And it, it just felt like torture where I arrived at a space and then the rug was pulled out from under me. And then I arrived at a place and the rug was pulled out from under me. And it, it never ended like through that process. Like I didn't get resolution through there. Alice in Wonderland. But then a short time afterwards, someone shared with me this thought that what made Moshe Rabbeinu so great was that he went, I don't know where he sourced it, was that he went through 50,000 that's not it's, which is... I found God. No, that's not it. I found it. That's not it. So he, he concluded 50,000 times that something is not God, right? Because God, we can't find God anywhere, but it's like, okay, it's not that. It's not that. It's not that. It's not that. So going through those, okay, there's something there. It's something. It's for sure something, but it's not it. And because he went through that so many times, like that's why he, he reached a certain level of greatness. I don't know the source for it. I don't know. I just remember who told me and it was Shortly after that, and I connected the two. Like that was what the journey was trying to, right. to, to tell me is just be very comfortable with. I found something, but not holding it too tight like that. So I imagine a ladder, where I have to grab something to lift myself up, but if I hold it too long, it prevents me from climbing higher up the ladder. Definitely, yeah, and even the in the search of the that's not it. When you come up against something that isn't it, what it essentially does is it forces you to turn around because you can't go further in this level of questioning. So maybe that is the it. The it is when, 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 you hit a, when you hit a wall, maybe that's God's boundary telling you turn around. So maybe it's not that it's not it. The perception of it not being it is part of the it. It keeps you exactly, God knows, God knows right. you're looking, right? He wants you to find him too. 
So the, the not its that you hit are like the, the boundary at which you know, okay, I got to turn, I got to turn, and I got to turn. So it's part of the it. Right. I saw some of the forward movement. It's not like linear. It's like to the right, you get pushed to the left. Like, yeah. And you're not moving forward by moving this way. You're actually moving forward by going in a certain direction and being no, not that far. So if life is all a simulation, maybe we're not moving at all. Maybe it's all moving through us. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. I've thought of... Uh... <laughs> the Matrix. We, well, we all grew up on the Matrix. Yeah. It's, uh, these are, and those are like beautiful questions to, to hold. And at the same time, say like, but there's someone sitting in front of me who needs food. I'm going to feed him. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 You know, yes. But also, yeah. I mean, on the journey, it can feel like, okay, nothing matters. Right. Right. But it, somehow it can, we can come to the exact opposite conclusion that everything matters a little bit more. I'm a figment of the imagination of God. Like all of us. Like all of us. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is there anything else? Final thoughts? Any more questions? Or I it's think complete? I think uh, it took us where we needed to be. Okay, good. One degree to the left. People. Hope it helps us. Yeah. I'll I, you know I, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll guess we'll know soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll find out if it did anything. If there was anything more than just a paper that got burned or there was... Well, that was your paper that got burned. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm not a pyromaniac. <laughs> <laughs> so if someone wants to borrow the technique, they can. Yeah. Yeah. But even with that, just to finish that, it's like not about that technique doesn't have some sort of magic technique. It was the intention behind it. It was like burn it, give it to God. Just like let, like completely let it go, give it to God. It's there. It's in the universe. What it, if it needs to land somewhere good? If it needs to fly away and be gone forever, also good. And in that case, it landed. It was more for the world knew that something a little bit more was needed, and I needed to hear and feel some of the pain right. that I caused her. And you were lucky enough to see that validated in real life. Right. By having that. And I think people are looking for that happy ever after or the closure. But I think it's important to come back to you did this for yourself. And if you shift something inside of yourself, your whole world is going to change. You don't need someone else to change for you. Right. Oh, I was right. In yeah. that case, I was fine in that moment. Right. I didn't need that. Right. You were you were so lucky to get that. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't need it. In that place like it was complete. I let it go. I had followed my sponsor advice. I did everything he said. It was uncomfortable. I went through it. And then that's it. It was done. And then something. I was like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> it was cool. But yeah, the idea is not to. I hope the guy is not waiting for that to happen. Right. With, with him. He would have missed the point of the story. Exactly. If he's waiting. It's kind of like your, the story you said about your husband framing the dollar. You're missing the point. Right. You're missing the point. And he right away took that exact dollar, put it into an envelope and passed it on. He says, I just know that more is coming. And there's always more. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate you making the trip. And uh, like I said, I hope it touches many people and I hope we see changes in ourselves. Amen. Right. Thank you so, thank much. You so much.